a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A phone call comes into your office from a man who tells you his wife has been murdered. He's not sure who the killer is. Your job? Find him. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. You'll find they now cost the same. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. You see, Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette because it contains the finest domestic and Turkish tobaccos superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. So compare Fatima yourself. Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. Dragnet. The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, January 9th. It was rainy and windy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 9.27 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide detail. Hi, Joe. Great night, huh? Yeah, terrible weather. Just look out there on Spring Street. Yeah, I know. I just came in out of it. Really coming down. Yeah. Just like I told you on the phone this afternoon. What's that? Every time those seagulls flying from the coast, it means rain. Yeah. It sure is a fine coat. I've never been sorry I bought this. Let me take another look at that, Joe. Yeah, sure. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. English coat, huh? Yeah. They make them a little heavier over there than we do here. Seem to be kind of good in our business. You remember that Henderson steak out last month? Oh, yeah. Really poured down that day. Mm-hmm. This coat kept me dry as a bone. Water just seems to roll off it. Yeah. That's a good one. There you go. Thank you. I have to hang it up. Mm-hmm. Supposed to keep a good coat on a hanger, you know, especially when they're wet. I bet you. The trouble with mine is it leaks right up here over the shoulders. Must be through the seams, huh? Yeah, I guess so. Same one I've been wearing. I told you about it before. You said you're going to get a new one, didn't you? Yeah, but it's such a good coat. Otherwise, I'd hate to throw it away. It's no good if it leaks. Oh, I guess you're right at that. Maybe I can get those seams fixed, do you think? Well, I don't know. How long you had it? Seven years. I'll get it. Homicide, Friday. This is 14 on the complaint board. Take this call. Right. Hello? Hello. Yes, sir. My wife's dead. She's been killed. I just went down to the garage, and when I came back, she was dead. Could you send somebody out here right away? Yes, sir. What's that address? 1627 Oxford Place. 27 Oxford Place. Yes, sir, that's right. can't understand that she was all right when I left, and then when I came back, she was dead. I can't understand that. We'll be right there, Mr. Gray. My best friend. Lives right next door. Yes, sir. 
بیشتر سمت دارد سکتین تونی سیون آکسفرد پلیس وز آن ایس ساید آف ستریت وز آن ایوریج ون ستوری ستکو هوم آل ها هومز آن ستریت وز آبات سیم جنرال ستایل و سایز It was a nice neighborhood. All the grounds appeared to be well kept from what we could see through the heavy rain. The porch light was burning when we got there. Inside the house, we were met by the two officers from Unit 37R who filled us in on the results of their preliminary investigation. We asked them to stand by in front of the house. Then we asked the husband of the murdered woman, Leonard Gray, to show us where the body was. Back this way, in the dining room. Uh -huh. Everything just the way you found it, Mr. Gray? You didn't touch anything? No, sir, I haven't touched anything. Right there on the floor. That's very fast. <laughs> Can I wait up there in the living room? Yes, sir, it's all right. Ben, would you like to help me? <laughs> yeah. Just sit right there. I'll be right with you. Thank you. You and your wife live here alone, do you? Yes. It's just two of us, no children. Ben. Yeah. The clothing's torn. Must have put up a struggle, huh? Yeah. Some redness there around the throat. Strangle? Yeah, could be. Deep gash there on the forehead. Broken vase there on the floor. You want to call the crime lab? Yeah, okay. Mr. Gray, where's your telephone? Right in the hall out there by the bedroom. Thank you. You think you could tell us about it now, Mr. Gray? Yes, I think so. Do you have a cigarette? Yes, sir. There you are. Thank you. Just a minute, I'll give you a light. Thanks. That's all right. Now, can you tell me just what happened here tonight? Earl Anderson, that's my friend, lives two houses down. He and I went out after work. We usually do once or twice a week just to have a few beers. Yes, sir. I don't know. I felt pretty good. I guess I had a couple too many. Earl said it was late and we better be getting home, so he did. I had a little too much to drink, so he drove. I see. Well, where were you and your friend drinking? The bar right across from where we were, Earl Anderson and me. A lot of the men go there for a beer right after work. Mm -hmm. Were there quite a few men from work in there tonight? Yeah, quite a few. I wonder if the other officer found the phone all right. Yes, sir, I'm sure he did. Kind of hard to find sometimes. Wife had it covered with little curtains. <laughs> That's all right, Mr. Gray. Let's try to take it easy. <laughs> They're on their way. Right. He was telling me that he and his friend Earl Anderson stopped yeah. after work. They had a couple of beers, and then the two of them drove on home. Right, thank you. Is that right, sir? Yeah, that's right. Well, we got home and I was feeling pretty good, so I asked Earl to come on in and have a little nightcap. Mm -hmm. What time was that when you got home? About half past six. Earl didn't want to come in because he said Hazel would be upset with me because we were a little late. Anyway, I finally talked him into coming in with me. Was your wife upset? A little bit, yeah. She used to be unhappy when I was late because of dinner. She was never unreasonable. I didn't make it a habit to stay out unusually late anyhow. All right, see? I feel terrible. It's terrible. And when we got in the house, the first thing Hazel asked me was if I'd looked at the car. Whose car was that? It's our car, Dodge Sedan 42. It's parked across the street now. I wonder if we might check back here a little. Yeah. I thought I understood you to say that you felt that you'd had a little too much to drink, so your friend drove this Earl Anderson... Yes, but it was his car. I guess I should have made that a little clearer. You see, we take turns driving home, either his or my car. We trade off to fight the traffic, no matter whose car. I see. wonder if you'd go on, please. I didn't know what she meant by asking if I'd seen the car. She said someone had let all the air out of the back tires. Do you know why anybody would want to do a thing like that? No, I had no idea who'd do that to us. Hazel said she wanted to use the car tonight. She had to go to a friend's house to help her do some remodeling or something. Uh -huh. She didn't say a word about my being late. I thought the car had kind of taken her mind off it. I told her I'd go out and look and see if I couldn't fix it. Well, did it strike you as being important that you fix the car right away? How do you mean? 
Well, sir, I was just thinking I wouldn't want to go out in all that rain unless it was something pretty important. Well, I didn't want to either, but I figured all I'd have to do was put a little air in the tires and then drive it down to the gas station. I see. Do you want to go on? Earl said he'd be willing to give me a hand, so we went out to have a look at the car. One look at the tires, and I knew we couldn't fix them. Somebody had cut them with a knife or something. They were beyond repair. Do you have any idea who did that? No, I couldn't figure it out. I have no enemies that I can think of. No one that would do a thing like that. What did you do then? Earl and I figured that we'd better take the wheels off, take them down to the garage and buy some new tires. I borrowed Earl's jack, and we took off the wheels. Uh-huh. Earl said he'd be glad to take the wheels down and that I'd better go back in the house with Hazel because she might wonder what we were doing about fixing the car. I understand. We talked back and forth for a minute or two, and I finally insisted that I go. Where did your friend, Earl Anderson, go? To his house. I dropped him off there. Where does he live? Just two houses down the street. Uh Uh-huh. After I dropped him off, I went down and picked up two new tires and two tubes, and they mounted them on the wheels for me, and I came back. About what time was it when you got back here to the house, do you remember? I don't know. Somewhere around 9.15, I guess. Then what did you do? I was going to put the wheels on, but I thought I'd better go back in the house and tell Hazel that I'd have the car fixed in a minute. Yes. And I walked in the door. I knew something was wrong. It seemed like I could feel it. I called to her. She didn't answer. Went through the house. And when I got to the dining room, I found her. We'll have to ask you to come downtown, please, sir. You'll have to give us a complete statement on this. Is that necessary? Yes, sir. I'm afraid it is. All right. I wonder if it'd be all right if I called my friend Earl Anderson to go down with me. I haven't told him about this. We'll notify him. Well, this friend of yours, Earl Anderson. Yeah. When you spoke with me on the phone, didn't you say something about your best friend saying that he thought that you killed your wife? Did I say that? Yes, sir, you did. I didn't mean it that way. How did you mean it? I've been drinking earlier tonight. Like I told you, I guess I must have gotten mixed up. When he didn't say that you killed him? No, no, he didn't. Well, I know this has been a strain and a pretty bad shock, Mr. Gray, but you told us that you didn't say anything to Earl Anderson about this. Now, isn't that right? I'm so sick and upset. Is that what I told you? Yes, sir. You asked me if it'd be all right if you called your friend. You said you hadn't told him anything about that. I did. I called him right after I got home. I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. Then you did mention your wife's death, didn't you? Yes, sir. When you men are questioning me, your tone sounds as if you think I might have done this. Well, sir, we're just trying to get the facts straight. Right now, anybody's a suspect. I didn't do this. I swear to God, I didn't kill my wife. Do you have any idea who might have wanted to kill Miss Gray? No, no one. Hazel and I didn't have many friends, no enemies that I know of. I see. You men have any ideas at all? Can you tell anything from what you've seen? We might know a little more after the crime lab checks things over. As soon as the lab men get here, then you can start on the case. No, sir. We've already started. Ten fifteen p.m. We continued to question Leonard Gray, the husband of the dead woman, Hazel Gray. His answer seemed to follow the same general pattern of hazy confusion. Ben and I weighed the possibilities and cause for his evident confusion. He admitted that he'd been drinking earlier that evening the tremendous shock of the death of his wife, the complete interrogation necessary in the investigation, all these things could prove to be reason enough for Leonard Gray's apparent confusion. They could all be possibilities of pretense as well. We had to be sure. We asked him about relatives and in-laws. He told us that his parents were not living, that his wife's mother and father resided in Los Angeles in the southwest section of the city. He gave us the address. He furnished us with a list of his friends and his acquaintances. He was feeling quite badly, but seemed to want us to continue with the questioning. From time to time, he would add unimportant bits of his story, which he had omitted the first time through. 10.17 p.m. The crime lab crew arrived and went to work. Gray's friend, Earl Anderson, was picked up and brought to the murder house. Any idea who did this thing? We're working on it. Just one thing I want to make sure of. Yeah. You don't suspect Len, do you? Why do you ask that? Well, I know how something like this can be. Len and Hazel are wonderful people, very good friends of mine. Just wanted to go on record as being able to vouch for Len. He wouldn't do a thing like that. Is that what you wanted to tell her? Well, yes, sir. 
I've known Len for about five years now, going on six. We work at the same place. Just want to vouch for him, that's all. Would you know of anyone who might have a reason to kill Mrs. Gray? Not a soul in the world. His was wonderful to everybody. She didn't have any enemies that I know of. Such a pretty girl. We know that you're a close friend of Gray's. Maybe you'd be able to answer a couple of questions for us. Any way I can be of help to you? Well, how did Mr. and Ms. Gray seem to get along? I mean, did they have any arguments that you know of? Well, I really don't think I should go into their personal life in this thing. You mean you don't want to answer? No, sir, it isn't that. It, well, it just seems that it's really not my place to go into it. We're going to have to question everybody that the Grays knew, all their friends and acquaintances. Appreciate any help you could give us. Well, it isn't that I don't want to help. I, I know that if I answer, it's going to make Len look bad at the moment. And we'll have to get all the facts from one source or another. Well, they used to have some arguments. Guess you'd find it out from the neighbors anyway. Were the arguments that bad? Pretty loud, yes, sir. Oh, I don't mean to imply that Len ever struck Hazel, but she used to get quite put out with him sometimes. Why? How do you know? Len likes to go out with the boys. You know, booze it up quite a bit. Mm -hmm. She used to tell him that she wasn't going to put up with it any longer. He said he never struck her. Not that I know of, Sergeant. Did they have these arguments often? I don't feel right talking this way about Len behind his back. Well, I know that as his friend, you want to get this thing cleaned up. Yes, sir, that's right, I do. Yes, he used to have quite a few arguments. Please understand that these differences of theirs may have been loud, but I know Len would never think of hurting Hazel in any way. I see. Did you find out who sliced the tires on Len's car? We're checking on it. wonder if that couldn't have some bearing on this. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, so we'd like to have you go back to the time you and Mr. Gray got home. Just tell us exactly what happened, would you? Will you excuse me for a minute? Sure. Friday, see you in a minute. Right, Harris. I'll be right back. Okay. We were just about through. It's all photoed. Lifted some prints. Coroner's ready to take the body, okay? Yeah, it's all right. Get anything besides the prints? Yeah, a small piece of blue cloth. White button attached. Looks like it was ripped off a shirt. Where'd they find it? Near the body. We'll see you fellas back at the office, huh? Yeah, okay, Harris. Thank you. I was just telling your partner, Sergeant, while you were out of the room. Yes, sir. In this kind of a case, if it turns out to be murder, you have to know the whereabouts of everyone concerned, don't you? Yeah, we do. I suppose Len told you about his going down to get the tires fixed on his car. Yeah, he did. Did he tell you that I was at home during that time? Were you? Yeah, I was. I don't mean to try to tell you your business or anything like that, but isn't that the sort of information you have to have? Yeah, that's right. Is there anything else you'd like to know? Yes, sir. Who killed Hazel Gray? You are listening to Dragnet. From beginning to end, Dragnet is the authentic story of your police force in action. Now, from beginning to end, the Fatima story. Actual convincing proof that in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos, the finest domestic and Turkish varieties, extra mild and superbly blended to give you a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Quality of manufacture, smooth, round, perfect cigarettes, rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Manufactured in the newest and most modern of all cigarette factories. Quality, even to the appearance of the bright, clean, golden yellow package. Carefully wrapped and sealed to bring you Fatima's rich, fresh, extra mild flavor. Because of its quality, its extra mildness, its better flavor and aroma, more long cigarette smokers are now insisting on Fatima than ever before. So if you smoke a long cigarette, compare Fatima. You'll find they now cost the same. But your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Insist on Fatima. Start enjoying the quality king-size cigarette. Fatima. Best of all long cigarettes. <laughs> p.m. Tuesday, January 9th. 
Leonard Gray, the husband of the murdered woman, and Earl Anderson, his friend, were taken downtown to homicide for further investigation. Complete statements were taken from both men. We checked them through R&I. No record on either one. We had all prowlers and burglary calls in the vicinity of the murder house rechecked. Units working in the area where the murder had occurred had picked up two possible suspects loitering in the neighborhood, but they were eliminated almost immediately. All of the neighbors, friends, and relatives of Mr. and Ms. Gray were contacted and questioned. No leads. All their stories tallied almost exactly with that of Earl Anderson. The Grays had been known to argue, quite frequently. The arguments were loud, but no one could say that they ever showed any physical violence toward one another. It was the opinion of the relatives and in-laws that Leonard Gray drank too much. Earl Anderson, his friend, was checked and found to be a completely reliable man. We talked with the repairman at the garage where Gray had his tires exchanged. His story was correct in every detail. Earl Anderson's wife was checked. She vouched for the Grays as well as her husband. Ben and I talked with Captain Steed for an hour. 1.45 a.m. Well, Skipper seems to feel like I do about it. Yeah, my husband, Gray. Huh? Sure looks that way, doesn't it? We've been over that story three times with him, and we get three different versions. Yeah, I know. It's completely sober now. He should be able to tell a straight story. No, I don't know, Joe. Yeah, well, I'm not completely satisfied. As far as that goes, the captain is neither. You heard him. I'll admit, Gray looks bad right now. What do you think? I don't know. I got it. All right. Homicide, Romero. Yeah, Edwards. No, Joe's right here. You want to talk with him? Oh, fine, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, thanks, Bob. Georgia Juvenile. Yeah? Picked up a couple of kids. They confessed to slashing the gray's tire. Well, it clears that up. Didn't seem to figure in any way. Did it to you? No. Unless somebody did it to draw gray out of the house. Well, it's cutting it pretty thin, isn't it? Yeah. What's the time? Ten minutes to two. Guess I better call Leighton Prince and see what they got. Okay. Did Edward say that they were going to hold those juveniles for us? Yeah, I said they were bringing them down here for interrogation. Mm-hmm. Oh, hi. Hi, Mac. From Merrill. Yeah. Uh-huh, good. Yeah, right, thanks. Yeah. Got something. What'd he say? One of the prints they left it out there is a palm print. McLaughlin says it'll work for elimination. And something else. Yeah. A print. It was pressed in spots of blood. <laughs> killer of Hazel Gray had left behind him a clue to his identity about which there could be no mistake. His palm print. The prints of the dead woman, Hazel Gray, were checked and eliminated. They weren't hers. 2.40 a.m. Leonard Gray and his friend Earl Anderson were taken down and fingerprinted. Their palm prints were also taken. Both men were returned to the interrogation room. Sergeant, why'd we have to be fingerprinted? Just routine. It's just like I was telling you, Sergeant Friday. What's that? Len and I have been suspects all along, haven't we? Well, it's just a matter of elimination. Anybody involved in any way has to be checked out. Didn't the fellow down at the garage verify Len's story? Yes, sir, he did. It's the truth. I wouldn't lie at a time like this. I don't believe that anybody thinks you're lying, Len. It's just they have to be sure. That's right. Hi, again. Interrogation room. This is Romero. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, right away. Crime lab, Joe. Finger says he and Jones would like to see one of us right away. All right, you want to go? Yeah, I'll be right back. Okay. Sergeant, was there really any specific reason for us being fingerprinted? Well, we already told you. It's just routine. Wouldn't it be perfectly in line to find Len's fingerprints around his own house? Well, yes, it would. Yours could be there, too, Earl. Yeah, I was going to say that. I'm over at their house a great deal of the time. Yeah, we know. You mentioned that. Makes you feel kind of funny getting fingerprinted. Doesn't make any difference what I have to go through if you can find who did this thing. I feel the same way, Len. Think you're any closer to knowing who did it? Well, possibly. You men have had a little time to think this over. Do either of you have anything to add to your story? Maybe some small detail you may have overlooked? Well, I've been thinking about it all night. I can't think of anything I haven't already told you. Mm hmm You, Mr. Anderson? Hmm? Is there anything that you might have forgotten to tell us? Sorry, I was just thinking. Yes, sir. There couldn't have been anyone Hazel knew, could there, Len? How do you mean? Well, somebody maybe from her past, somebody she might not have told you about. I don't see how that could be possible. You people checked your father and mother, didn't you? Yes, sir, we did. Well, that eliminates that possibility. Haven't you found any way at all of telling who it was that killed Hazel? Yeah, we have. 
Oh, I think that Len here is entitled to know. I'd be glad to leave the room if you want to talk to him alone. No, sir, that's not necessary. When we work it out, you'll both be told about it. If there's something definite, you'd tell me, wouldn't you? I think Earl's right. I'm entitled to know. Well, sir, we're assigned to the investigation, Mr. Gray, and we're doing everything that we can to get to the bottom of it. Sergeant Len and I think you men know a great deal more than you've been telling him. His wife was a victim. It's his right to know how the investigation is going, isn't it? Well, I told you before, whatever he should know, we'll tell him. Anything that we withhold from him is done for a good reason. Joe, want to take a look at this? Yeah, thanks. Mm-hmm. Here's a report on it. Oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. That shirt belonged to either of you, ma'am? It's not mine. No, why? What's it mean? I get it. Interrogation room Friday. Yeah, Dean. Mm-hmm. Right. Thank you. What about that shirt, Sergeant? What's it mean? This button here. Little piece of cloth attached. It's found with the body. You notice the front of the shirt here? Button ripped off? See how it matches? Yeah. It's not my shirt. It was found in your house. I never saw it before. It's not mine. The palm print was. What? The print of your palm. Blood stains on it was found near the body. What's he talking about, Earl? What's he mean? I killed Hazel. What? I killed Hazel. Why? Because I loved her. I think I loved her more than you did. You don't kill someone because you love them. You do if you love him enough. You ready to give us a statement, Anderson? Yeah, I'll tell you. I can't believe all this. I don't want to kill you. All right, Gray. Hold it. I can't believe it. My best friend. I wasn't your best friend. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On April 4th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 89, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Friends, let me tell you how to size up king-size cigarettes. First, take a Fatima, and then any other king-size cigarette. Side by side, the two may seem to look alike, but they're not. Because no other king-size cigarette has Fatima quality. That's right. In Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality that starts with a blend of the finest domestic and Turkish tobaccos and follows up with extra mildness, a better flavor and aroma. Now, if you haven't tried Fatimas yet, take my advice. Buy a pack. Compare Fatima. You'll find, just as I have, that in Fatima, the difference is quality. <laughs> Taylor Anderson was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. At home and overseas, in camps, hospitals, and military installations, and in battle areas, Red Cross personnel work for the welfare, recreation, and morale of those who defend the nation. Today, Red Cross is expanding these services to keep pace with the rapid growth of our nation's defense forces. Your support of Red Cross makes this expansion possible. Remember, when you give to the Red Cross, your gift is a lift to our fighting men. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Our thanks to Quick Magazine for this week's salute to Dragnet's Jack Webb. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portions transcribed from Los Angeles. Hear a gold smuggling case on Counter Spy next over most NBC stations.
My name's Jeff Regan. I'm the lion's eye, his private eye. Gumshoe, peeper, Seamus, whatever you want to call it. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, International Detective Bureau. He's a guy who likes to make money. But when he makes money, I get into trouble. Here's the kind of adventure you've been waiting to hear. Hard-boiled action and mystery as told by Jeff Regan, Investigator. So stand by for trouble. Stand by for suspense. Stand by for adventure. In tonight's story, The Lonesome Lady. And now, here's Jack Webb as Jeff Regan. Well, this is the way it started. Everything was routine. Melody was at her typewriter working on the usual sheet of paper, backed by the usual four carbons, routine. The smell of the lion's 50-cent cigar hung in the room, routine. And the air conditioning was out of order, all routine. I looked over Melody's shoulder and read the memo. Attention, International Detective Bureau, Anthony J. Lyon, from the American Insurance Company Claims Division. Here you are. Keep the original for yourself and give the others to Mr. Lyon. I guess you're going to be on this. On oh, what? Beautiful thing, you. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Jeff, Jeff, don't. Jeff, don't do that. Somebody might phone you. Mr. Lyon, I'll tell you all about it. My uh, new boyfriend, huh? <laughs> Not Jeff. Mr. Lyon's waiting for you. Okay. I'll talk to you later. Riga. Ever hear of a guy named John R. Renzo? Nope. A doctor named Maurice Wade? Nope. A French dame named Marie Rochelle Portier? Nope. Should I? Maybe. I don't know yet. It's all routine stuff on that American insurance company contract. They want us to do a little work for them. Their claim man came in about an hour ago all excited about Renzo. He kicked off early this morning. I can't very well meet him. It is a time and a place for wisecracks, and this isn't it. It figures. Renzo kicks off, and the American insurance company's going to have to kick in with $35,000 his beneficiary. And that's Marie Rochelle Portier. No relation. Girlfriend, I guess. It's almost a bank buster for AIC. So, you want me to see her? No! It'd be ticklish if it turns out to be legitimate. Now, you better look at the other angles before you see her. If AIC has to pay off to that dame, we might just as well say goodbye to their business. I can't stand much treatment like that. You mean you want me to find a way for them to get out of it? I didn't say that! Legitimate, they'll pay. That's nice. What I want you to find out is how a guy carrying $35,000 worth of life insurance winds up croaked in a hotel on Main Street with two dimes and three pennies sitting on the dresser. It could happen. Sure, it could happen. But you find out why it could happen. Renzo's worth 23 cents alive and $35,000 dead. And the county's going to have to plant him. The insurance company doesn't like it, and I don't like it. How'd he die? Well, the coroner says it was a hard job. Insurance company? Insurance office says Renzo applied for the policy three weeks ago. It was approved ten days ago, and he kicks out today. Everything's fine. On paper. So what am I supposed to do? Find out what isn't fine about what that physical Renzo passed. Now, you can start with the insurance doctor. Name him Maurice Wade. And get on him first. And call me if you run into any trouble. <laughs> The place I was looking for turned out to be a brand new three-story building on Wilshire Boulevard. In the hall, I could still smell wet plaster and cement. There was one name on the neon-lighted directory, Dr. Maurice Wade, Internal Medicine, Diagnosis, and the numbers 310. The sign on the self-service elevator said, do not use, so I climbed the three flights of marble stairs. The first door at the top was 310. Enter. I entered. A blonde girl in a white uniform, sitting at a small desk, smiled up at me through sharp white teeth, showed me one well-shaped leg and two well-manicured hands, all routine stuff. How do you do? Have you an appointment? No, I don't. I was hoping I could see Dr. Wade without an appointment. Well, that's almost impossible. He's so busy these days. I'm Miss Porter, his nurse. Perhaps I can help you. My name's Regan, but I'm afraid I'll have to see him. Oh? 
Oh, if you don't mind, I'll just stick around and wait for him. Oh, he isn't in just now, and I was just about to go to lunch, Mr. Regan. Well, that's fine. We'll go together. Dr. Wade will be in at 2 o'clock. You can come back then. I get it. 2 o'clock. It was right then that my day began to change. I stepped outside the office door and walked over to the brand new stairway of that brand new building. Now get this. I stopped a minute because I thought I heard somebody opening the doctor's door. I turned around to take a look when I felt something brush my arm. The stairway suddenly turned upside down and began to walk up me. There was a lot of noise all around and I was trying to yell for somebody to shut it off. It got louder and louder and louder. It was then I decided this wasn't routine. Thanks for helping me tow him upstairs. He'll be all right now. I'll take care of him. He'll be all right. He'll be all right. I was lying on a leather couch in a point the room. A tall, thin man with a hooked nose seemed to be running things. He was waving an arm at a vague crowd of people near the door. Then somebody I couldn't see shoved a bottle under my nose. Give him a whiff of that. There you are. I think you'll be all right now. Now then. Can you hear me, mister? No, don't try to move yet. Nothing broken, but you had quite a tumble for yourself, my friend. Quite a tumble. You might have been killed. That's what I was thinking. Somebody shoved me. What's that? I was shoved. (laughs) That's crazy. I was on the second landing when you come falling down. Wasn't anyone around? Why did anyone want to shove a man down a flight of stairs? I don't know. You're just plumb bruised and battered, mister. When you get to thinking about it, you just got dizzy from the heat or something. How didn't you? Maybe. I'll show you. Mary, hand me that like a good girl. Here you are. Here. Try a little of this. (coughs) Thanks. That help? Yeah. Have another. You want me to call you a taxi, Mr. Regan? No, thanks. I got a car out in front. Well, better you rest up a minute or two longer, friend. My name's Wade, Dr. Wade. This is my office. Wade? You're the man I came to see. Well, I don't believe I know you. You one of my patients? Oh, this is Mr. Regan, doctor. I explained that you took patients only on appointment. Mm-hmm. Well, as long as you're here, Mr. Regan, what can I do for you? Well, I'm not a patient. I been retained by the American Insurance Company to investigate a claim concerning a former patient of yours, a man named Arenzo. A private investigator. We're checking on a policy that was issued on him. You were the examining doctor. You don't represent the district attorney's office or anything like that? No, I don't. I'm with the International Detective Bureau. You don't have a warrant that says I have to show you my files. No, I don't. But I thought that as long as you were employed by the insurance company and you conducted the examination, that you well, let Give me back my bottle, mister. And then you can get on out of my office. Huh? And get out fast. If I'd have known you was something like that, I wouldn't have drugged you up here in the first place. Now get on out of here before I throw you out. Well, you can see how things stood between Dr. Maurice Wade and me. I walked out of the place with as much dignity as I had left. I had other plans. There were other files to look at and other people in the city I could talk to. Detective Sergeant Salvatore Wendetti, morgue detail was sitting in his office, chewing on a cold cigar, reading a traffic bureau memorandum on the new liability laws. Well, 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 if it isn't Jeffy the Regan. How are you, Jeff? Boy, I haven't seen you in a long time. Pull up a chair. What happened? I fell down a flight of stairs. Mm, you ought to be more careful. Lots of people get killed doing things like that, so what can I do for you? Sally, I want you to find out about a man named John R. Renzo for me. He died this morning, and your office is handling it. Renzo, 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 John Renzo. Johnny Renzo. Yeah, sure, we got him in the icebox now. I want to see him handle it myself. No, 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 thanks. I know he's dead. What else? Well, never really a bad actor. Never really a good one, either. Mind you, all the boys in the beat knew him. Why? Come on, tell me some more. Well, he made Lincoln Heights jail about nine months out of 12 on a vag rap, one thing or another, routine. Vagrancy? Just one of our lazier citizens, so he's dead now, so what's to it? <laughs> he was insured for $35,000. Oh. <whistles> yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So somebody's mighty glad to see little Johnny dead. Who gets it? Her name's Marie Rochelle Portier. No relation. How time in the old town tonight for her? Mm Mm-hmm. 
Tomorrow night. The insurance company has 24 hours to investigate. Ah, that's what you're doing. All right, Regan, what else? Well, you got the coroner's report? Oh, sure, sure. The idea came in an hour ago. It was a hard job. You sure? Positive. No one better than Johnny Renzo. It was bound to happen the way it did sooner or later. Was he an old man? Forty-five, fifty, maybe. You can never tell on that kind, but all of us around here knew it. Knew what? That his ticker's been bad for years. Every time he made the heights, I'd give him a soft job. Couldn't take a chance. Hey, look, Sally, are you telling me it was chronic heart condition? I'm telling you it was a chronic heart condition. Well? Mm-hmm. I need that telephone. Uh, uh, not this one. Only inside call. Try Try the one across the street. <laughs> Hello. This is me. I ran into some trouble. What kind of trouble? Well, you, you'll have to get me a warrant or something so I can get in that doctor's office. What? He wouldn't play ball. He threw me out. Now, the coroner's report shows that Renzo has a chronic heart condition. Then he never should have passed a physical. I thought that'd get through to you. But we'll have to find out what's in that doctor's office before we can do anything about it. Now, look. Get a hold of one of those double-breasted lawyers and rig up a thing, will you? Hey, Melody, get my lawyer on the phone. It may take the rest of the day to get you in there legal, and we haven't got the time. So get busy. I just told you I can't get in. If I can't get in, I... Can't get in. I hung up the phone, stepped out of the booth, and crawled into my car. I was sitting there fumbling with the keys, wondering how I was going to get to those files when somebody else figured it out for me. He was a big man in a brown sport coat. Take it easy, Pilgrim. I just want to talk to you a minute. Well, that's tough, Pilgrim, because I don't want to talk to you. I've had a busy day and I... Wait, oh! I wouldn't try anything like that, Pilgrim. I just got here. Ain't no lots of holes. Come on, this one's just basic. I can tear your arm right off if I have to. You... Wake up, Seamus. I'm here on business. Yeah? What kind of business? You just been in to see when Daddy? Sure, I've been in to see him. He's a friend of mine. By the muscle act. Just to make sure you don't start hollering when your brain's out of something. Let go. Okay, so what did he say? Ooh. What did he say about what? You know what. Renzo. Well, the county's going to bury him. More, Seamus. <laughs> Keep talking. It only makes sense. He's dead. For good. Ooh. More. He died of a heart attack this morning. Somebody gets 35,000 bucks because of it. And you've been seeing people, a doctor, when daddy... Uh, day next on your list? Maybe. Oh, is that what you want to know? Yeah. You're a good boy, Regan. Now, here's what you want to know. You forget everything you know about anything. You don't say a word to nobody. No one. Understand? No one. Not even your own mother. Just forget it. <gasps> right. Now, remember... Not a word to anybody. Or else. I wonder if you'd do as good without a gun. Oh. I'll see you later, Pilgrim. Sure you will. Sure you will. But in case we miss connections, and so as you won't forget me, here's something to remember me. Oh. So long, Pilgrim. Turn to Jeff Regan, investigator, in just a moment. The Army Nurse Corps Reserve still has commissions available. If you're a graduate registered nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, you may be eligible for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps section of the regular officer's reserve. Those who meet the high standards and qualify to serve with this fine organization may elect active or inactive status. Nurses requesting inactive status will continue with civilian nursing, but stand ready to serve in time of emergency. In addition, they have the opportunity to take advantage of special training courses. Nurses who request active status enjoy the same pay and privileges as all other officers. Graduate work is provided at the Army's most modern teaching centers, and the nurses obtain educational experiences that benefit them in both civilian and military nursing. 
Now, if you believe you qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington 25, D.C. That's the Adjutant General, Washington 25, D.C. And now, back to the story of the Lonesome Lady and Jeff Regan, Investigator. This wasn't routine either. It was brass knuckles, a big man in a brown sport coat on the front seat of my car. I guess I fell onto the horn into my steering wheel. I couldn't seem to sit up straight and get away from the noise. Hey, don't you like peace and quiet? Hey, come on, sit up. Oh. Oh. What happened to you? I don't know exactly. I don't know. Gee, yeah, your face is cut up a little bit. You have an accident or a smash up? Yeah, something like that. You want me to call a cop? No, oh, no. I'll handle this myself. Yeah, but don't you think you ought to go home and get some rest? Uh, maybe you ought to find yourself a sawbone or something. Huh? Yes, sir. Maybe you ought to find yourself a doctor to kind of fix you up. You're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, that's a good boy. You take care of yourself, young. Yeah. There's doctor on the door, doesn't it? The office is still open, isn't it? Yes, but I thought Dr. Wade told you that he didn't want you here. I heard him, but this is different. If he doesn't see me now, I'll phone the state medical board and the lawyer and anybody else who's handy and make him a first-class Simon Legree for refusing me emergency treatment. Now, cut him out. Oh, you're hurt, Mr. Regan. Oh, please sit down. Sit down right here. Where's your doctor, lady? Oh, he isn't in here. He's already gone for the day. Let me see. What happened? You tell me, lady. I'm just a peaceful citizen looking for a doctor. Uh, uh, sit still. That's a nasty bruise on your forehead. Yeah. I got some better ones where a man tried to cave in all my ribs. Uh, hold still. Lift up your face to the light. Uh, uh, That's better. Ooh. Tender? Uh-huh. Mm. First the stairs, now this. You've had quite a day, Mr. Regan. Maybe you ought to quit. Uh, hold that right there. Mm-hmm. While I touch up this cut on your chin. Eat. Uh, who'd you say you uh, worked for? International Detective Bureau. I'd resign if I were you. They're working you too hard. What's happened lately isn't exactly routine. What happened lately? Well, I found out that the man who died this morning had a chronic heart condition and he should have never been insured. Your doctor's in this up to his ears for passing him. Go on. A big man in a brown sport coat doesn't want anybody to look into anything. He's the one who did this. That's right. Hmm, that should hold you. Thanks. Oh, wait a minute. Where do you live? Huh? Your address. I'm coming over to your place tonight. You are? If what you say is true, my doctor's going to get 5 to 15 in San Quentin for doing a fix on an insurance examination, and I might be dragged into it. And I wouldn't want that to happen. So? So I'm digging up that file and bringing it over to your place, and we'll see what's what. Why not look at it right now? Isn't here. We just moved to this place three days ago, and half the stuff is still in the old office. All right. I'll buy that. Try 1720 North Taft, 308. In about two hours. Why so long? You need some rest. Besides, your shirt's bloody. Well, what was that name? John R. Renzo. R-E-N-Z-O. All right. You can expect me. Feel better now? Uh, yeah, much better. <clears throat> you know, you freeze me, lady. Your boss throws me out. You fix me up. You help me. 
Maybe I wouldn't have fallen down those stairs if you hadn't sent me out to eat alone. Call me Mary if you like. I thought it'd be something like that. Mine's Jeff. I've had a hard day, Mary. I know. But maybe it'll be a better day from now on, Jeff. You know, I had a feeling I was going to like you. It was just about then that I remembered the beneficiary. She was my last call. I bucked beach traffic out Wilshire and pulled up in front of the Beverly Hills address Lyon had given me. A row of brass mailboxes on the outside of a four-unit court told me that Marie Rochelle Portier lived there. The man in overalls watering the lawn blinked at me, frowned at the cut on my chin, pointed to his own, and shook his head. I nodded back, wondering what Marie Rochelle Portier, or whoever she might be, whatever a racket might be, looked like. I found out. Yeah? It was the big man without his brown sport coat. This time it was swimming trunks, and he looked as big as a super cheap. I threw my whole arm into his face. He staggered backwards into the room trying to get his balance. I let him have another one in the stomach. He was out of condition. One more, and his chin was cut. He went down, taking a lamp, a card table, and a glass of warm lemonade with him. Oh, yeah. It's real good to see you again, Pilgrim. All right, James. All right, you're, you're the champ. Come on, get up. Get up. If I might have known I was going to find you here. Where's your girlfriend? No, no, no. Just a minute. I said, where is she? She ain't around. Ain't no one around but me. Honest. Okay, you give it to me. What are you talking about? Oh, you, I've met citizens like you before. Oh. Now, come on, make it straight. Oh, all right, all right. Oh, you busted my head. I'll make it straight. Marie's my girlfriend. She calls me today, tells me what you look like. Tells me where you'll be. Tells me what to do. I do it. She knows who an insurance stick will go to. All right, go I on. i catch you at the morgue. You're nosy. She says to rough you up a little bit, make you forget what you're doing for a while. I find you like she says and do what she says. And, uh, nothing personal, in it? What about the doctor? He split with you and her? Ain't no doctor in it. It's just me and Marie. How'd she fix it for Renzo to get insured? I don't know. She's got connections. She gets around. That smart guy. Come on, spill. Honest, honest. That's it, Shamus. That's all. That's all there is to it. We worked it a couple of times before. I don't know how she fixes it, but she does. I do all the heavy work, and we get along fine. Now, and then somebody gets excited, and I have to cool him off for a time. But, but well, that's it. Straight. Honest. Hey, what are you doing? Shut up. Well, now, don't call the cops. Give me a plate, will you? Will you shut up? Lance. Me. Regan, where have you been? I'm calling from the address of Marie Rochelle Portier. I told you not. Look, there's a big ape here who roughed me up today trying to put me out of commission. I don't care about that. We have only 12 hours. Come on out and pick him up and get a statement for a warrant. Warrant for who? For Marie Rochelle Portier. This monkey can give you enough to have her picked up. She's the one we want. You sure about that? I found out that the doctor who wouldn't let you into his office is in a lot of trouble. Got a wife suing him for divorce, and he no, might have no, been trying... No, no, it's the here, dame, we want. As soon as you get a warrant on her, it'll make that insurance policy invalid. I still don't trust that doc. It's early yet. Why don't you oh. hop over? You, you bringing the cops out here? Look, Seamus, I got a little dough, and it, it'd come to more than the ten a day in expenses you're getting well, if you're... Now you. Now you. Well, well, Stay here, Pilgrim. I'm tired. I'm going home. I've been waiting for you. Forget about me? No. The janitor let me in. I told him you were my brother. That's nice. You didn't come straight home and get some rest. No, I had a couple of things to do first. Well, sit down. I fixed your drink. Good. Hot day and all. Thanks. Now, uh, tell me about your doctor, huh? Hmm? Some things I know already. His wife's suing him for divorce, trying to get every penny he's got. He doesn't like me. That's it. Or... Maybe he just doesn't like any private detective or anybody else who might be working for his wife, huh? 
Maybe. Uh, if I can spot a man who's being taken to the cleaners, he's one. He's pretty touchy these days about all the trouble she's probably caused him. What's this got to do with us? The stars are coming out. Uh, just straightening out. Well, if that's the way things are with him, then my job's finished. Good. Now we can relax. Mm-hmm. You've been working much too hard. Jeff, put your arms around me. Feels good. Good to have arms around you in a big city like this. Such a big city. So many people. Mm-hmm. You're nice, Jeff. Sometimes it's so lonely. And sometimes it's like this. Sure. Sure, Marie. Darling. <laughs> Marie Port here, Mary Porter, it's all the same to me. No, don't reach for it, lady. I took it out of your purse. You I tricked... know, I tricked you. I've been wanting to trick somebody ever since you shoved me down that flight of stairs this morning. Ever since you shagged your big boyfriend on me. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. I'll not kill... today you won't. I'm not insured. All right, take it easy. Oh, let me go, Jeff. Let me go, please. You were so lonely in the big city that you just sat down and passed time making out phony medical reports and counting the insurance checks that you collected on bad bets. Oh, please, Jeff. I... Oh, just let me go, please. So you have me thinking that a doctor's phony when the only thing that's bothering him is a wife and a divorce. Oh, Jeff, listen to me. And when I start getting close, you try to scare me off. And when I get really close, you figure to drop over and put on a good act. Oh, Jeff, Jeff, listen to me. They'll send me to prison. They'll they'll make me grow old and ugly there. Oh, Jeff, please, please let me go. I'll do anything. Jeff, you can let me go. You can, you can. You will. Oh, please, Jeff. Please, me again. Go. Got that warrant? Yeah, he oh, spilled. Please. Where are we going to find that Dave? Please. He's probably skipped. Oh, no, she's yeah. at my place. What? Do anything, Look, anything. get somebody over quick, will you? Oh, please. Get him over while she's still here. Please. Well, I told it all to the lion, and... He told it all to the American Insurance Company, and they renewed our contract. She's being arraigned next Monday. What happens after that is up to the jury. Melody had a question. Jeff, what do you think they'll do to her? Well, she'll get about ten years, I guess. If, um, if Mr. Lyon hadn't had that contract with AIC... Would you have turned her in? Sure, I'd have turned her in. It's my job, isn't it? Well, it's a big city. A lot of lonesome people down there. They allowed her one call when they took her to jail. She called here asking for you. Jeff, why did she do that? I don't know, Melody. I don't know. The easiest way to save for the future is to buy United States savings bonds. Your nearest post office, bank, or savings and loan association can accommodate you. Or you can buy bonds on the payroll savings plan. Just ask your employer to start deducting for a bond a month. A bond a month is good security for the years to come. For money in the future, buy United States savings bonds now. You will be glad you did. Jack Webb is starred as Jeff Regan, with Wilms Herbert as Anthony J. Lyon. Eve McVeigh was heard as Mary Porter, and Ken Christie as the big man. It's CBS, same time next week, for hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, investigator, as he tells the story of the lady with the golden hair. Jeff Regan, investigator, is written by E. Jack Newman, produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with original music by Del Castillo. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima cigarettes. Best of all, long cigarettes brings you dragnet. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. A middle-aged businessman in your city is robbed and beaten senseless. The hold-up men escape. The victim refuses to report the crime. Your job? Investigate. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. You'll find they now cost the same. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. You see, Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette because it contains the finest domestic and Turkish tobaccos superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. So compare Fatima yourself. Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima... The difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, October 8th. It was overcast in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. It was 11.23 a.m. when we got to 700 South Hill Boulevard, the Butler Accordion Studios. What do you think? Oh, well, I don't know. It must be upstairs, I guess. Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there it is. Main office, second floor. Yeah. Who is that, Joe? What? That portrait up there on the wall. Printing underneath here. Nice painting. Yeah, it says Damien, the father of the accordion, Vienna, 1829. Hmm. What do you know about that? Must be it down there, huh? Yeah. Want to try? Yeah. Yes, sir. Are you Lewis Butler? Yeah, that's right. Can I help you? Police officers, Mr. Butler. I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Is your name Friday? Yes, sir, that's right. This is my partner, Sergeant Romero. How do you do? I'm sorry, Sergeant. I told you on the phone. I just don't want to talk about it. We'd appreciate it if we could have your cooperation. It's a pretty important matter. Well, I'm the only one concerned in it, as far as I can see. I just as soon forget the whole thing. Besides, i got a pretty busy day ahead of me. Well, we'd like to straighten you out, Mr. Butler. It concerns a lot more people than just yourself. Now, we're not going to take much of your time. Just a few questions, that's all. I told you on the phone, Sergeant. I don't want to talk about it. Can't you just forget about the whole thing? It's only going to take a few minutes, sir. All right. Come in if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Place is in kind of a mess. Wife's away to mother's. Oh, you can sit down if you want. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Pepper. I'll feed you. Uh, just a minute. It's a nice cat you got there. Siamese? A little bit, yeah. It's my wife's. Don't care too much for cats myself. All right, Captain. Now, wait a minute. Get your nose out of here. Here you go, Pepper. That ought to hold you for a while. Look at that, Jill. Sure goes for that mail, huh? Yeah, it sure does. You're going to have to make it fast, Sergeant. I got an appointment for lunch downtown. All right, sir. I'd just like to have you elaborate on what Dr. Hart told us. Is he your family doctor, by the way? Yeah, that's right. He had no business calling you in the first place. I told him I didn't want it to get out. What did he tell you? He said you came to him for treatment night before last. You told him you'd been beaten up and robbed. He treated you for cuts and bruises about the face and head. No, it was nothing. Didn't amount to anything. Well, was there actually a robbery, Mr. Butler? 
Believe me, Sergeant, it didn't amount to anything. I, I don't even want to go into it. How much did the robbery involve? Money, I mean. I'd rather not say. I don't want any fuss made about it. That's why I didn't report it. it just isn't worth it to me. We understand the holdup men took more than $800 from you. Wouldn't you like to get that money back? I don't want to be nasty about this thing, but I was the one who was held up. Now, if I don't want to press the case, I don't see why anyone else should worry about it. It was my money. How about the beating that the thieves gave you? It's nothing serious. It's like I told you on the phone. I want to forget about the whole thing. Well, it must have involved more than just a few scratches from the looks of you, and the doctor had to treat you. Take my word for it, please. I'm all right. I don't want to press charges. I appreciate it if you'd give us some kind of an explanation, Mr. Butler. Why? I don't want to bother, that's all. There's nothing to explain. Well, you have to admit that this is a little unusual. Somebody beats you up, slugs you, takes $800 from you, and you don't want to do anything about it? You're going to have to excuse me a minute. I have one of my accordion students down the hall in the practice room. Almost time for him to go. I have to give him his lesson for next week. All right, sure. Go right ahead. Hey, long deal. How about that? Yeah. Acts like he's scared to death. Well, yeah. whoever it was, they gave him a going over. Half of his head and bandages, face all swollen. Sure something phony. Well, he's not going to be much help unless we can talk him into a crime report. Huh? Somebody's got to him. I'll bet on it. Come on. Hi there, Kitty. Hi, Kitty. Uh, I've been thinking it over, officers. I'm sorry I had to come out here go to all this trouble, but I just as soon forget the whole thing. I don't even want to talk about it, if you don't mind. We don't mean to high-pressure you, Butler, but we'd like some kind of an explanation. Well, can't you understand? I just don't want to make a big fuss about it. I'd like to have you go along with my feelings in the matter. It's my affair, isn't it? No, sir, it's ours, too. Half a dozen people like yourself have been beaten up and robbed in this neighborhood all in the last five weeks. Now, if we can find the thieves, we can put a stop to it. We can make sure the same thing doesn't happen to your neighbors. Well, they're going to have to look out for themselves. I'm not getting tied up in a big investigation. The neighbors don't worry about me. Well, it goes a little further than that. Huh? You've been beaten up and robbed once. How do you know it isn't going to happen again? Well, it's not, that's all. I'll make sure it doesn't. How? What's going to stop the same thieves from knocking you over again? Look, if it's all the same to you, I want to forget about this. I'm going to have to be running along. It's getting late. No, there's just one more thing, Butler. When the doctor was treating you the other night, this Dr. Hart, he says you told him that you knew who the holdup men were now. Is that right? No, he got it all mixed up. I didn't mean it that way. How did you mean it? I'm in a funny position. I just can't explain, that's all. I can't take the chance. Did the holdup men threaten you? I can't talk about it. Give me a break, please. You're making a mistake, mister. Play ball with those thieves and they'll ruin you. It's not only me, it's my family, too. I'm not going to take the chance. If they threaten you and your family, you're taking more of a chance keeping quiet about it. They'll bleed you white, blackmail, robbery, anything you can think of. Now, this has happened before. Can't you see the spot I'm in? I know who they are. I know what they can do. i got a wife to think about. Would you put your family in that position? You're buying protection from a couple of hoods. Now, figure it out. How much is it worth? How far can you trust them? If you pick them up, they'll know I told you. I don't want anything to happen. Can't you see that I haven't any choice? What else can I do? Help us put the thieves where they belong. You'll have all the protection you need till they're locked up. It's a big order. I don't know. You and your wife will be under 24-hour guard. Now, that's a promise. How long would that have to go on? Long enough to bring them to trial and convict them. Now, how about it? They warned me about telling the police. They said they'd get both of us if I did, me and my wife. Now, they meant it, too. They'd get us. What can you do about it? Get them first. <laughs> After another hour of talking, we finally persuaded the robbery victim, Lewis Butler, to come downtown with us. He dictated a full statement about the holdup and filed a crime report. He told us he'd been robbed and slugged late at night a few blocks from his music studio. $820 had been taken from him by two bandits, both of whom were armed, both of whom he recognized. He said one of the men was a Marvin Carter, a former bartender at a neighborhood tavern. The other was Ralph Quincy, a merchant seaman. We went across the street and met with Deputy District Attorney Fred Henderson. The next day, the case was presented to the grand jury and a true bill was returned. The two suspects, Marvin Carter and Ralph Quincy, were indicted on one count of armed robbery. That afternoon, both of them were booked at the main jail and then released after posting a required bail of $10,000. 4.30 p.m., Ben and I went back to the office and met with Captain Didion. How are you making out on it? Pretty fair shape, Skipper. The arraignment's set for two weeks from Thursday. How about protection for the victim? Well, it's all set up. Butler and his wife are under 24-hour guard. Three teams of men on it. Mm-hmm. There's two thieves getting out on bail. It's not going to make it any easier. Who are you working with from the DA's office? Henderson. Seems to think we've got enough to convict both men. What makes them so sure? Well, for one thing, we got a line on a couple of good witnesses to the hold on. Excuse me. Robbery did in. Yeah, Mike. No, I'll check it before I leave. All right. What was that about witness? A man by the name of Bartlett runs a drugstore. He and his son were in the neighborhood when Lewis Butler was held up. 
They're supposed to have spotted the two thieves running from the scene. Have you talked to them yet? Just over the phone. We've got an appointment with them at 6 o'clock tonight to take your statement. I guess I don't have to tell you. Stay as close to the thing as you can. If we miss this time, we may not get another chance. You know as well as anyone how tough it's been reaching these things. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't be this far along if Butler didn't decide to cooperate and file charges. I wish I knew how many victims there are in this thing just like Butler. People we don't even know about. So scared they don't dare file charges. I guess there's a dozen of them anyway. I can't tell you. People hire a police force on salary to protect them and their property. Then they turn around and try to make a deal with a bunch of hoods, buy them off. How far have you gotten on the holdup gang? Well, how do you mean? The two men you've got, Tad, Carter, and Quincy. Anyone else working with them? Possible, not sure yet. Both Carter and Quincy have juvenile records. That's about it. We're still checking on them. Robbery, did he? Yeah, Tom. Mm-hmm. That's right. No, I'll tell them. They're here with me now. Right. Thank you. It started already. How's that? The victim, Louis Butler. He got a phone call at his house a few minutes ago. Yeah? Figured it was one of the hold-up gang. They gave Butler a choice. What did he say? Either he drops the charges or they'll kill him. <laughs> 5.30 p.m. Captain Didion issued orders that the two suspects in the case, Marvin Carter and Ralph Quincy, be placed under 24-hour surveillance. An additional team of men was assigned to guard Lewis Butler. Each officer was carefully instructed to take all possible precautions to prevent the robbery victim and his wife from being harmed in any way. 6 p.m. Ben and I met with the two witnesses to the holdup. A drugstore proprietor, Sam Bartlett, and his teenage son, Harold. They told us that they'd been in the immediate vicinity the night Butler was robbed and that they'd gotten a good look at the two gunmen as they ran from the scene of the holdup. Bartlett and his son Harold identified the suspects as Marvin Carter and Ralph Quincy. Statements were taken and both witnesses were warned to maintain absolute secrecy about their part in the case. Next day, we made arrangements to have the druggist and his son subpoenaed for the Superior Court arraignment. Six days went by. Thursday, October 17th, 8 a.m., we checked in the office and found the message waiting for us. What is it, Joe? The druggist's son, Harold Bartlett. What about him? Found him in an alley, three o'clock this morning. What? Yeah, slugged and beaten. Late that afternoon, Ben and I received permission from the doctors to visit briefly with our witness, 17-year-old Harold Bartlett. His injuries were painful, but not critical. The beating he'd received was nothing less than brutal. His left forearm had been broken, and he'd been beaten viciously about the face and chest. He told us that he was on his way home from a neighborhood movie just before midnight when two men jumped him from behind on a deserted street. Well, I drove around some, maybe five or ten minutes. I lost about at least three men in the car. Well, why do you say that? Well, there were two in the back seat with me. Somebody else had to be doing the driving. Mm-hmm. And it had to be a sedan and a club coupe. I guess so, yeah. After he drove around a while, he stopped the car, and then they began slugging me. Didn't say a word the whole time, just started slugging me. I asked him why, and just kept slugging me. I see. At first, I think they were hitting me with their fists. And it felt like something a lot, a lot harder. A piece of iron or metal or something. That's when I grabbed the cloth off of my face, and I started to holler. Mm-hmm. What happened then? Oh, and Yes, nobody heard me. Nobody came anyway. One of the men swore at me and grabbed my arm. Hit it with something. Sure, sore. They didn't say anything to you all this time? No. Not until just before they pushed me out of the car. It seemed like I was at that car for hours. When they started to talk to you, Harry, what did they say? It was about that robbery my father and me saw. The one you talked to us about last week? Mm-hmm. What did they say about it? I said, maybe this will help you keep your mouth shut, stay out of other people's business. I said that a couple of times. I said a lot more would happen to Dad and me if we went to the police, if we were witnesses at that trial. Do you remember some men called each other by name? No, I don't. I don't remember anyway. Well, son, you remember when we talked to you and your father last week, we told you to say nothing about the case to anyone. Mm -hmm. I remember, Sergeant. I guess it's my fault. Well, did you tell other people that you were a witness in the case? Did you mention it in public? I guess I did, yeah. I didn't think it was that important. I guess I, I talked about it quite a bit. I'm sorry. It's 
my fault. That's all right, Harry. If you remember it from now on, it'll save a lot more trouble. I remember, Sergeant. Those two men last night scared me for a while. Guess most of it was talking, huh? How do you mean, sir? They never warned me about staying away from the cops. They said they'd kill me and my dad if we were witnesses. Mm-hmm. They were probably just trying to scare us, huh? They were fooling. Well, you had a sample last night, son. Yeah. Were they fooling? After we left Harry Bartlett, we went back to the office and arranged for a 24-hour guard to be assigned to the teenage boy and his father. A thorough investigation of the attack on the boy failed to turn up any leads. On the surface, the two robbery suspects, Carter and Quincy, were not involved. During the week that followed, we heard of no further threats or attacks, either on the victim, Lewis Butler, or the witnesses involved in the case. Ben and I worked with Deputy District Attorney Henderson preparing the case against the two suspects. Two days before the trial opened in Superior Court, we got an urgent call. Yeah, I know, but how did it happen? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're all right, Tom. Thanks. Well, what's the trouble? Couldn't be worse. No victim. What do you mean? Mr. and Mrs. Butler have disappeared. listening to Dragnet. From beginning to end, Dragnet is the authentic story of your police force in action. Now, from beginning to end, the Fatima story. Actual convincing proof that in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos. The finest domestic and Turkish varieties, extra mild and superbly blended to give you a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Quality of manufacture. Smooth, round, perfect cigarettes. Rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Manufactured in the newest and most modern of all cigarette factories. Quality even to the appearance of the bright, clean, golden yellow package. Carefully wrapped and sealed to bring you Fatima's rich, fresh, extra mild flavor. Because of its quality, its extra mildness, its better flavor and aroma... More long cigarette smokers are now insisting on Fatima than ever before. So if you smoke a long cigarette, compare Fatima. You'll find they now cost the same. But your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Insist on Fatima. Start enjoying the quality king-size cigarette. Fatima. Best of all long cigarettes. Tuesday, November 5th, 9 a.m. The trial of robbery suspects Marvin Carter and Ralph Quincy opened in Superior Court, Department 88. The complaining witness, Louis Butler, failed to appear. For two solid days, we'd been busy checking all of the Butler's friends and relatives in the city. They couldn't help. Each time the butlers had left their residence, they'd been under surveillance. We'd had an understanding with them that in the event that they were in their automobile, and for some reason the officers assigned to them lost them in traffic, the butlers would immediately return to their home. On the night of November 3rd, under the pretext of going to a neighborhood theater, the butlers made a right-hand turn from a left-hand lane of traffic, so it became obvious that they were trying to elude the officers following them. A check was made at their home as prearranged, and they failed to return. When they failed to appear for the trial, a bench warrant was issued by Superior Court for the missing couple. Deputy District Attorney Henderson asked the court to grant a delay in order to find the butlers. It was granted. In the meantime, we'd gotten out a broadcast and an APB. Missing persons detail helped out in the search. Still no sign. Tuesday, November 12th, 11 a.m., Deputy D.A. Henderson phoned us from the Hall of Justice. When was that, Fred? Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. What do you have to say? The attorney for Carter and Quincy asked the court for dismissal. No complaining witness. Well, the judge ruled on it, sir? Yeah. Case dismissed. No matter how guilty the two men might have seemed, there was nothing further anyone could do. Without a complaining witness, our case was finished. The two suspects, Carter and Quincy, were released from custody. In a few days, Quincy left town for the east. Carter remained in the city. The search for Mr. and Mrs. Butler went on. No sign of either one of them. December came, and then the Christmas holidays, New Year's. 
On January 16th, Lewis Butler suddenly reappeared back in town and surrendered on the bench warrant. They explained to the judge that because of the numerous threats on their lives just before the trial, they were afraid to appear and that they left the state without telling anyone. The judge gave them a lecture and a warning and dismissed charges. Another month passed, February and then March. On April 2nd, we got word from Denver, Colorado, that one of our former robbery suspects, Ralph Quincy, had shot and killed a 24-year-old policeman while attempting a robbery in that city. Quincy was tried and convicted of murder and received a life term. In the meantime, we'd heard little or nothing about the other former robbery suspect, Marvin Carter. Another two months passed. Spring months wore on into summer. Monday, July 8th, 8 a.m. Friday, Romero, see you in a minute. Yes, Skipper. You want to sit down? I got something for you. Yeah. A hold-up victim, man by the name of Sheridan, came in late last night, filed this crime report here. Have a look. Let's see, Joe. You can notice there it happened in the same area where we had that rash of holdups last fall. Yeah, I see. Victim robbed and beaten. Suspects used the same approach, same M.O., followed it right down the line. Yeah. Victim warned not to contact police. Bodily harm threatened if victim did so. How about the descriptions of the holdup men here? The victim pretty sure about them? Gaffney handled the report. The victim said he got a good look at one of the thieves. Gaffney gave him a bunch of mug shots to look at. Yeah. Here's the one he picked out of the lot. Oh, thanks. Have a look, Joe. Marvin Carter. As soon as the robbery report had come in, an immediate check had been made of Marvin Carter's last known address, an apartment in the West Pico District. The landlord revealed that the suspect had moved at least two months before. We got out a broadcast and an APB on him. Together with Sergeants Gonzalez and Henry, Ben and I started on a systematic check of all of Carter's known friends, relatives, and associates. After that, we started on the places he was known to frequent, Hotels, bars, restaurants, no luck. Two weeks went by. There were no further reports of robberies where the M.O. of the criminal matched that of Carter's. Tuesday, July 26, 2 p.m. We got a call from one of our informants, uh, Bertie Simmons, who told us that he might have some information for us. He said it concerned Marvin Carter. He told us he'd meet us at MacArthur Park on the 6th Street side at 2.30 p.m. 2.50 p.m. You have to excuse me, Sergeant. Sorry I'm late. I have to move from that other place. Things haven't been going too good for me. That's all right, Bertie. What's the matter? No luck with the horses? Yeah, a lot of luck. It's all bad. If there's a pig in the race, I have to bet on him every time. Getting so I can't even pick him to show anymore. I don't know. What else is new with you, Bertie? No job yet? No, but I'm still looking. Been down around some of the joints, South Main, Alameda. Keeping it near to the ground. Mm-hmm. Want to smoke? Yeah, thanks. Don't mind if I do. There you go like for you. Hmm. Well, what have you heard, Bertie? Anything that'll help? That Marvin Carter, you're still looking for him, aren't you? That's right. Any rumble? I heard it last night, having a beer downtown. I knew you fellows were in a little bind on the thing. I always like to help you when you're in a bind. Well, what'd you hear, Bert? Carter's still in town, hiding out. <clears throat> like I say, I always like to help you out when you need it. Mm -hmm. I know what it is to be in a bind. That's when you appreciate help most. I'm kind of in a bind right now. A little short, you know. A couple of dollars, Bert. That's all I have on me. Will I help you out any? Saved my life, Sergeant. Tell you the truth, I didn't know where dinner was coming from tonight. No need telling you. I appreciate it. What was this you heard about Carter? Still in town. There's a place down by Venice, near the beach. Mm -hmm. Kyle has been seen there once, twice lately. It's a little seafood joint. Beer and clams. Down by the beach. Well, now, is that somebody's story, or is it the real thing? The real thing, Sergeant. You know me better than that. No phony leads from me. Where's Carter supposed to be staying down there, do you know? Well, I do and I don't, I guess. What do you mean? This mooch had told me about Carter last night. He didn't know the address, but he described the place Carter's supposed to be hiding out in. I know the joint he means. But you don't know the address. No, but I can point out the place he means. It's a shack right along the speedway down there, down by the beach. Mm -hmm. You want to run down there with us now? Sure, I'll point it out for you. I'm not going near it, though. Why do you say that? Don't want to mix with it, that's all. I got the word. What do you mean? Carter. Won't be an easy one to take. How do you know? He's got a gun. 2.55 p.m. Along with our informant, Bertie Simmons, Ben and I drove down to the beach town of Venice. Bertie pointed out a brown wooden frame cottage where Carter was supposed to be hiding out. 
While Bertie waited in the car, Ben and I checked it out. There was nobody at home, but there was plenty of evidence inside the cottage that Carter was living there. I went back down the street to where we parked our car. I kept an eye on the cottage while Ben got to a phone to call the office. Pretty down here, huh, Sergeant? Yeah, it's a nice day. I don't get out in the air enough. I think that's my trouble. Some of this good ocean air makes you feel like a million. Yeah. Did you notice the place where your partner went to phone down the street there? Yeah, what about it? You see the sign, Beer and Clan? Right over the door? Beer and Clan? Yeah, mm hmm. Best in the city, I know. I've been there. Only great. Good beer for a dime, fresh clam, nothing better. You like clam? Yeah, they're all right once in a while. What am I going to do if you two have to wait here all night? Well, we'll get you back to town, Bert. We'll figure out something for you. Hi, Ben. Did you get a hold of Captain? Yeah. Marvin Carter was picked up downtown 20 minutes ago. What? Yeah, I was driving a rented car. Traffic unit picked him up. Will they tab him on his description? No, at first. The reason they noticed him was because he was double-parked on a busy street, and they pulled him over and got a better look at him. I did. Any trouble with him? Not at all. Got him booked at main jail. Say, that's sure too bad, and... What do you mean, Bert? It's your case, isn't it? How long have you fellas been working on it? Mm, just about a year, huh, Joe? Yeah, just about. Coming all this way for nothing. You're ready to make the pinch, and somebody else does it for you. Must be kind of disappointing, huh? All that time, all that work? No, Carter's in jail. That's the main thing. I guess we better drive back in, huh, Yeah. Uh, say, just a minute, Sergeant. No use coming all this way for nothing. Wonder if you do me a favor. What's that, Bert? That sign down the street. Which? The blue and white sign, Beer and Clam. Wonder if you could drop me off right in front. Beer and Clam? Oh, yeah, Bert, all right. Sure nice of you. Just like I was saying. What's that? No use coming all this way for nothing. <laughs> just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 29th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 86, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Friends, let me tell you how to size up king-size cigarettes. First, take a Fatima, and then any other king-size. Now, side by side, the two look alike, but they're not, because no other king-size cigarette has Fatima quality. That's right. In Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality that results from a blend of the finest domestic and Turkish tobaccos. Quality that gives you extra mildness, a much better flavor and aroma. Remember, if you haven't tried Fatima yet, take my advice. Buy a pack. Smoke Fatimas and you'll discover what I know. In Fatima, the difference is quality. <laughs> Marvin Lawrence Carter was tried and convicted on several counts of first-degree robbery and was sentenced to the state penitentiary where he is now serving his term. First-degree robbery is punishable by imprisonment from five years to life. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Lyle Rooks, editor of Radio Television Mirror. The readers of Radio Television Mirror have chosen Dragnet, the favorite program of its type for 1950. I am privileged to present the citation to you on behalf of the editors and readers of Radio Television Mirror throughout the nation. Thank you, Miss Rooks. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portions transcribed from Los Angeles. Stay tuned for Counter Spy next over many NBC stations. Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak, for hire. Sure. 
Find Pat Novak for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. You gotta put it in block letters, because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, there's a price tag on everything. You gotta do that or marry a rich widow. I don't like to work that hard, so I rent boats and do anything else that's cash and carry. Oh, it's all right if you don't mind trouble, because that's one thing you can't duck. It's like trying to dance the minuet in skis. And the best trouble always looks good from the outside. You're all smiles and feel like a kid opening a hand grenade under the Christmas tree. I found that out Tuesday night. It was around 7 o'clock. I was getting ready to close the office when this little guy showed up. He was about the size of a golf bag with arms. And if he had a cigar box, he could see over a pool table. He walked up to the desk and started talking in a voice that made you think he was trying to put Lily Ponds out of work. Hello, you know back? You're doing all right so far. What's on your mind? I'm Jackie Gregg. You heard of me, huh? You're the shy type, I know. I'm Jackie Gregg, the jockey. You heard of me, huh? All right, now I heard of you. Put the show on the road. I'm looking for a horse. You want to find me a horse? Yeah, I breed him in the back room. What color do you want? You're so tough I got to take that from you? Calm down before you wind up in a boy's choir. If you got anything to sell, put it on the line or beat it. I'm riding a horse tomorrow called Fleet Lady. She's disappeared. She's not here. I'm supposed to ride the sixth race with her tomorrow. The Bonanza handicap, and she's gone. All right, she's gone. Maybe your horse likes to go out at night. I haven't seen her. Get to the point. I'll give you 200 bucks to find that horse. Somebody took her in a van. I uh, trailed her down here at the waterfront. But you lost him up at the ferry building. That's right. Something funny's going on. My mouth disappeared, and you got to find her. This is a big waterfront, and where's the 200 bucks? You'll get that all right. Down by Pier 19, the van turned in. Think you can find Fleet Lady? I don't know. Who owns her? Woman named Sybil Thornton. She's uh, mixed up, I think. Yeah. Why steal your own horse? I don't know. Run a ringer, maybe. That's a tough trick. This woman's got some good ones. You want the 200 bucks? Yeah. How are the odds? What's the difference? You're going to open a book? You better take the 200 bucks now. Yeah, the dough will keep. You sound frightened, Junior. And you sound nosy. Here's the 200. I want you to find the horse. You let me know at the Kingston Hotel, huh? Sure. And if you don't find anything around the waterfront, maybe you better try the track. Ask around there. Yeah. By the way, how do you fit in? How come you got $200 interest in that horse? Maybe I love horses. What do you care if maybe I love horses? I don't. A guy like you's got to love something. Oh, yeah. It was a sweet proposition. A jockey in search of a horse. There's something phony about the whole thing. I had the 200 bucks, but I didn't feel good. It was like a guy stealing a murder gun to help out in a scrap metal drive. Well, after the little guy left, I closed the office and started to hit the docks, but it didn't work out. You know, you can buy good whiskey these days, so you feel funny walking up to some guy on the pier and asking, have you seen a racehorse around here, mister? By nine, I was sure the horse wasn't around, so I borrowed a car and drove out to the track. I found out where Sybil Thornton's horses were quartered and headed down that way. It was pretty dark, so... When I bumped into her, all I got was a vague outline. She had a good-looking vague outline. Oh, I'm very sorry. Yeah, I'm full of regrets, too. Should we try it again? But you're a little mixed up in your animals. They keep horses here. You don't seem to mind. No, you lean nicely, but you'd probably feel safer with a platform. Yeah. Well, we try this again when I've had three good meals. That's a horse. Yes, I know. In fact, I own it. I see. That'd make you Sybil Thornton. Yes, what would it make you? A guy named Pat Novak looking for your horse. I was hired in the waterfront to find her. My, they grow big on the waterfront. You must get a lot of sun. By the way, is Fleet Lady missing? Your jockey says she is. That's why I'm snooping around. Didn't know he had any friends. He's got a checkbook. How about Fleet Lady? Is she tucked in bed? Yes. Well, let's take a look, huh? Find her very dull, Mr. Novak. Yeah, that's what they said to Anthony. Let's see the horse. Suit yourself. She's down this way. Okay. I'm doing this out of the bigness of my heart. I think you're wasting my generosity, Mr. Norris. I don't use it all this trip. It's from the stable. Come on. It's all about here. Fleet Lady's stall. Here. The flashlight on the wall. All right. Oh, poor thing. Do horses die broke, too? Who is it? Fleet Lady? 
Yes, are you satisfied? No, I'm going to ring up headquarters. You crazy. Then I'm going to call Jackie Gregg and tell him his hunch paid off. I wouldn't do that, Mr. Novak. Stop kidding me, sweetheart. She didn't get killed in a fight with another horse. Gregg figured somebody was telling the machine. That's why Fleet Lady's dead. That's why I'm going to call headquarters. Suit yourself, but remember what happened to Fleet Lady. Are you getting tough, Angel? No. You just wouldn't look good with a saddle, Mr. Novak. <laughs> Well, I watched her as she turned and walked out of there. It was the kind of a walk that makes you flip the calendar and find out how far away spring is. I looked around a while, but it didn't do any good. The place was full of doors, so whoever killed Fleet Lady got out easy, like a rumor at a church picnic. I closed the door and went down the line to call headquarters. As I stood in there talking, I saw Sybil Thornton drive away. It was a long convertible with red asbestos seat covers. After I called headquarters, I went back and waited near the stable. About a half hour later, a police car pulled up, and when I saw who got out, I began to get unhappy like a three-legged man in a ballet school. It was Hellman from Homicide, and he had a squad with him. All right, all right, I'll talk to him. Hello, Novak. Where's your trainer? Your boys get paid to laugh at you, Hellman. I don't. Yeah, where's the horse? What are you doing on the case? I came for the ride. You mind, Novak? No, I just wondered if they wised up downtown. Huh? Because you could find a dead horse, Hellman. If they staked it out in the middle of Market Street, you'd find it before long. I'll try this time. Where is it? Stall 18, over there. Uh, keep an eye on them, boys. I'll be back in a minute. In here, Novak? Yeah, the one with the teeth like yours. You better shut up, Novak. Don't get jumpy. I, you haven't seen the horse. Just shut up, huh? It wasn't going to be much of a conversation anyway. What color horse was that, Novak? What do you mean? Take a look at it. Yeah, I did. I just took a look. It's a smart horse, Novak. What? That's right. That dead horse in there is wearing a double-breasted suit. Hellman got the message straight. I walked in and took a look. Jackie Gregg was lying there on the floor as dead as last year's love. The sickness didn't show until we rolled him over on his stomach. Somebody had gone duck hunting in the middle of his back. I began to feel a little sick myself, and I was ready to send up for the same gun when Hellman started to talk. You forgot to mention the guy when you phoned headquarters. He wasn't there. I was in here before, and the guy wasn't around. What was he doing under the horse? I don't know. Hellman maybe crawled out of a crack. I don't know. There were two shots. I came in and found the horse. Yeah? Check the horse. You're trying to tell me the horse shot back? Who is he? A guy by the name of Jackie Gregg. He gave me 200 bucks to find a missing horse. Yeah? A horse called Fleet Lady running into Mars Handicap. This is the end of the line. How do you know it's the same one? I don't. Maybe you've got to be a horse to tell. Why don't you ask one of your boys? <laughs> Yeah, your boy's real tough. I'll call him off, Hellman. He's nasty. We all hate him, Novak. It's all right. I'll put it on your bill, Hellman. That's good. You can write it up at headquarters. Hellman, you ought to rent an idiot. The heavy thinking's too much for you. I can piece this together. We come out here and find a dead man with you kicking up dust 40 feet away. Look, Hellman, I didn't kill the guy and call up headquarters. I know they're bad in homicide, but I'm not that big-hearted. We got a spare hook for you, Novak. That's where you stay until somebody gets you off. And you can start out with Sybil Thornton. Another horse? She's got the speed for it. Look her up. She owns Fleet Lady, and she was dashing around in the dark here, playing easy to get. I'll look her up. You better leave the boys behind, after all. She's only a woman. When you see her, ask her about that van down on the waterfront and what she was doing before I made that phone call. I'll tag all the bases. Don't worry, Junior. And if things fit together, you'll both be in the jug. I'll see you later. I got work to do. Yeah, it's getting late. You better put the boys back in the cage. I began to worry after Hellman left. There was no murder gun, and he didn't have too much to go on, but there was no one else wanted my job. Oh, I knew the girl was going to have an alibi. I was the last guy that Jackie Gregg had seen. I had about as much chance as a fat girl at a Princeton prom. Hellman didn't like me, and he was a smart cop with a disposition like a ton of rhubarb. Well, I had to start right from scratch. I felt like Adam the first morning he woke up. So I looked up a guy named Jocko Madigan, an ex-doctor and a boozer who would give you a lift if you show him where the stirrups are. He's a good guy, but he thinks all food makes a gurgle. I hit all the bars and finally found him up at Maggie Nielsen's apartment. She's a good-looking voice that lives up on the hill, and Jocko was working his way into her liquor supply. Hello, 
Patsy, you're just in time to join me for my first drink of the evening, uh, or uh, one of my first at least. Yeah, I see. Maggie's not here, but I found her whiskey. It was in plain sight, locked in the closet under some newspapers. All right, Jocko, when are you going to sober up? Oh, I plan to do it briefly on April 1st, when the rest of the world plays the fool also. Look, I'm in trouble, Jocko. you got to help me. Good. I have a special bottle I use to forget your troubles. Now, look, stop caressing that jug and listen to me. I'm in a jam. Patsy, there's nothing in nature so sad as a half-empty bottle. It's like a broken vow or an unfulfilled promise in the skies. A falling star almost. All right, Jocko. A falling star and you shrug it off, never realizing that a whole world has ended at that moment. Yeah. A hundred million dreams, maybe, and you watch it fall and make an asinine wish. That's all the good it does a star to fall. It gives some kid a chance to wish for a bicycle. You all finished now, Jocko? Yes, what kind of trouble? Anything I could aggravate? I'm mixed up out at the track. A guy by the name of Jackie Gregg is dead and I don't look good. Oh, Hellman? Yeah. The guy's a jockey and he hired me to find a horse named Fleet Lady. Did you? The horse and the jockey ran a dead heat, but there's something funny about the whole deal. Did you talk to the jockey? No, not enough. Oh, Patsy, you've got to break yourself of the habit of waiting until people are dead before you think of a question. Jocko, I want you to hit all the horse rooms. Find out what you can about the six race tomorrow. It's the Bonanza handicap. Now hurry up, will you? Well, if it's the six race, why can't we wait a while? Start now. Get everything you can and call me. I'll leave a message at your place. Where are you going? I don't know. Maybe up to see the girl. Oh, Patsy, you're going to be waving at the hangman's wife when they spring the trap door. I gotta see her. She owns Fleet Lady. Well, why don't I see her? She's got a stake somewhere, and I got a lot of questions. What could you do up there? Ah, oh, yes. If it weren't an academic question, I'd argue the point. Oh, it looked like a bum deal right from the start. Patsy, you have the instinct for recognizing trouble, but not the intelligence to duck it. Save your breath, will you? You're like a man walking under a scaffold on a building. You realize it may crash down and kill you, but instead of hugging the building where you can't get hurt... Like every other dope, you scurry for the edge of the sidewalk where you're bound to get hit if it falls. Jocko, will you get out to those horse parlors? I need facts, not fables. Now, give me a hand. All right. Give my love to Fleet Lady. Her name's Sybil Thornton. I'll bet I'm not far wrong. Good night, lover. <laughs> After I left Jocko, I went to the Chronicle Morgue and looked up the NBC program director, Paul Stangle. We pulled out the clips on Sybil Thornton. They were nice and fat because she'd been to Reno four times and hadn't broke training for years. She'd been traded around more than a Red Sox pitcher. The clipping said she was 32. There were a lot of pictures. And from her eyes, you got the idea she was around 35. But there were arguments the other way, too. Well, there weren't any stories on her for the last few months, just a few items from the columns. They all said the same thing. She was hitting the night spots with a gambler named Rudy Hauser. There were pictures of him, too. Now, he would look good in a cave with heavy curtains. I asked Paul. He said Hauser had a gambling place out on Geary, so I took a cab out there. For ten bucks, the guy at the door said Sybil Thornton had left the place an hour ago. That made me feel good. When Hauser opened the door to his office, I lost the glow. Yeah? What's with you? I got a problem. You got the wrong door. Well, you can't get any tougher, so I'm coming in. Mm. Suit yourself. I never throw anybody out until I'm sure they've lost all their money. What's on your mind? A horse named Fleet Lady. She disappeared at 7 o'clock tonight. Well, you check under the rug, I'll try the cabin. She got back just in time to greet somebody's guns. If I say no, will you go out and lose your money like a good boy? Fleet Lady was owned by a gal named Sybil Thornton. The columns say you're number five on her list. Well, they never lie. The whiskey's too good. Also, a little bird says she was in your office an hour ago. That's right. She said your name's Novak. Yeah. Next time you got a bombshell, give it a test run. With Fleet Lady dead, your money's going to look real good in the six tomorrow. Well, it makes you think the gal would throw a race. For the same reason she goes out with you? Huh? When a gal takes a great dame like you out in public, it generally means the guy's a few bucks ahead of her. <coughs> you want to fight the team now, Novak? Mm-hmm. Just remember, sometimes you can't be right in a gentleman, too. Yeah. I hope that's the way you feel when they pick you up for Jackie Gregg's murder. Huh? Oh, you do a real nice double take, mister. The jockey checked out with a horse. I didn't know that, Novak. Yeah, with no brains, you built this gambling club. I didn't know he was dead. If I told you that, Novak, I meant it. He's all right for a little punk. I'm sorry he's dead. So's he. I'll see you later, Hauser. I gotta nose around and find out where you were tonight. Yeah. You seem all right, Novak. So I'll tell you. 
you got any dough left when you leave my table, it's better on a horse named Fleet Lady in the sixth race tomorrow. Do you always bet on a dead horse? You got the tip? Use it or bury it, but don't loan it out. <laughs> The case was a regular grab bag when I walked out of Hauser's office. I began to tick off the things that didn't add up. First on the list was that van down on the waterfront. If it was Fleet Lady, who got shot in the stable? If it was the ringer, that meant Fleet Lady would run tomorrow. Oh, I couldn't figure out why Hauser was so sure she'd win. An idea kept racing around the back of my mind like an ant in a cookie factory. Jackie Gray lied about that van down on the waterfront, but Why? Not to bail me out of the poorhouse with 200 bucks. Uh, I got part of the answer when I stopped with the pay telephone and called Hellman. Yeah, Hellman talking. This is Novak. I got some news. You'll have to put it on the back page. What do you got? Your friend Jackie Gray had some love life. Well, there's a chance for you, Hellman. Who's the girl, Sybil Thornton? Yeah, we found a picture in his wallet. The gooey turned. I bet you stole it for long train rides. What time did he die? The right fit for you between 9 and 10 o'clock. Two shots from a 32 caliber pistol. How about the horse? 45 caliber. Two people. It's getting involved. Maybe. Look up a guy named Rudy Hauser. He's got a joint out on Geary Street. I got enough friends. You look him up. I did. He's still talking about Fleet Lady in tomorrow's race. All right, maybe he's sentimental. Look, Novak, I'll pick out my own work. I don't need free help from you. Jackie Craig paid 200 bucks and look what he got. That suits yourself, but Rudy Hauser and that gal are close friends. Yeah? Like two-part harmony in a telephone booth. Get off the dime, Hellman. Hauser's got that gal in his hip pocket. She owns Fleet Lady and he's betting her to win. You're trying? It's got to be a slow field to lose to a dead horse. Wake up, Hellman. You couldn't smell a rat in a basement full of cheese. I did all right in your apartment. Huh? That thirty-two caliber pistol, we found it in your place. See you later. Well, I wasn't too worried about that. Hellman's smart enough to know a phony plant. I began to think about that thirty-two caliber pistol. It's a woman's weapon. Well, that doesn't prove anything. So's a bread knife if she's in a bad mood. Must have been about midnight when I got to Sybil Thornton's place. She was wearing black lounging pajamas tied tight around a slim waist. She looked like a wasp with a nice sting. And she had company. Come in, Mr. Novak. Yeah. Mr. Novak, this is Ronnie Stark. Hello, Novak. Yeah. Well, he's not very friendly, Sybil. He's just parting because they're going to arrest him for Jackie's murder. How do you like Hellman? You've known him longer. Yeah. Somebody left the murder gun up at my place. Where you been all night? Please, Mr. Novak. You're embarrassing Ronnie. That's right. I'm blushing, and it's not the whiskey, Novak. I see. You must stay longer, Ronnie. Uh, she's persuasive, huh, Novak? See you tomorrow. You won't forget, Ronnie. No, I won't forget. I'm betting on you, Novak. What won't he forget? Mr. Novak, I hope nobody ever asks you that question. Hmm. You don't want to talk about putting that gun in my apartment? No. Let's talk about Rudy Hauser, then. Hmm? Your meat grinder friend. We just had a good talk, and he opened up a new road. What'd you tell him? Don't break a spring. He's all right. Will you do me a favor, Patsy? Like not talking to Hauser anymore? Huh? That's right. Won't do you any good, Patsy. It'll do me a lot of good. How's he going to know which horse got killed? I bet you lied to him, Angel. It's my apple cart, Patsy. Leave it alone. Sure. But play your hand right, baby. Because I'm going to watch your cards. And if you got one that says Jackie Gregg, I'm going to call you the hard way. Patsy, you nice beast. I really think you would. Sit down. Yeah. A drink? No. Do you good? Not right now. Well, you've read the book. Just a couple of chapters. I bet they're the right ones. You better watch out, baby. I may be a long shot. Well, you care as long as I bet. I don't. That's good. I didn't think you'd mind. Aren't you beginning to crowd the beachhead? Don't be a sissy, Patsy. You can't live forever. All right, Angel. It's time to wire the folks. Mr. Novak, just wait until you know me better. That's for me. I left the number. It's your fault, then. Yeah. What'd you find out, Jocko? Not much. Nobody seems to care about the sixth race. I care about it. Oh, that's because you killed one of the jockeys. The rest of the people have a more casual interest. How do the odds run? Oh, no heavy favorites. Been there and sleepy time gal figured to be the best. At around five to one. What about Fleet Lady? Down the line somewhere. I talked to one fellow. He 
say she's a dog and couldn't beat a paralytic goose over a hundred yards. Yeah, what else? Well, that's all. What do you mean, that's all? Start digging, Jocko. We're not getting any place. Not even at your end? Huh? Well, I counted on you to do better than that. Good night, lover. <laughs> On the way home, I bought the morning papers. There was no story on Jackie Gregg, no details, and most of the story was a statement by Hellman on Hellman. There was no mention of Fleet Lady, and at one o'clock in the morning, there was nothing I could do but roll into bed. I woke up about nine, called Jocko. It was like sending a message out to the Farallones by Indian Runner. He just muttered and said he'd meet me out at the track. Well, I had to have some more dope, so I called Ira Snow... He calls the races and bets on him. The way he does it, a horse is a real beast of burden. He was playing elf when I got him on the wire. Yeah. Ira, this is Novak. What do you know about the Bonanza handicap? It's a horse race. Oh, you're funny. What about the field? Are the horses any good? Uh, for hamburgers, maybe. Nothing else. How about Fleet Lady? Eastern track. Nobody knows. Would she be worth a heavy plunge? Yeah, if you want to be a monk. What's this all about? Ira, I'm in trouble. How about a fix? Could they run a ringer in on Fleet Lady? Yeah, it's been done before, but it ain't easy. That's what I figured. How's Rudy Hauser on horses? He never bets. Well, I think you're wrong. Look, Novak, I know every guy in town that's got the itch. Rudy Hauser, no. You know a guy named Ronnie Stark? Sure, he runs a book. Why? Nothing. May see you at the track. I'm going to make a bet. Yeah, I'll tell the horses. Well, that left me in a hole. If Ira was right, Rudy Hauser on Fleet Lady didn't make a bit of sense. I got out to the track about 2.30. Jocko was there, and Hellman was wandering around up in the grandstand where they couldn't push him into a starting gate. Sybil Thornton waved from her box as I walked by to get a better shot at the starting line for the sixth. They were almost at the post when Jocko came back from the betting window. Well, Patsy, I bet two dollars on a horse called Scotch Victory. It seemed like a good omen. Yeah. I saw your friend Rudy Hauser at the window. Huh? He was pouring money down on the favorites to win. Well, that's why the odds are going down on Vinair and Sleepy Time Gal. Look at that board, will you? Yeah, Fleet Lady's gone all the way up to 12 to 1. Yeah, from 8 to 1, all the way up. Maybe the word got around she's dead. No, that's the funny part. She's down there. See, number three on the rail. Not a peep out of anybody. <laughs> Better hurry up or he won't see much. What? He better hurry. He left the track ten minutes ago. Huh? Are you sure, Jocko? Yes, I heard him tell someone he had to make a phone call just before the betting closed. Well, Jocko, you're a sweetheart. Oh, I like to think. Come on, let's go to that stable. The race is no It was over five minutes ago. Well, how about my two dollars? Come on, will you? There's only one person who won't try to fix a horse race. That's a horse. I knew there was going to be trouble fast. The horses were just coming under the wire when I waved to Hellman and started for the stable. When we got there, Sybil Thornton was clearing out like a fire sale. I'm in a hurry, Patsy, darling. Let me by. Now, you made a bad play, Angel. Stick around. Let me by, Patsy. You heard him, lady. Stick around. Thanks, copper. I'll take charge. That's a big gun, Housie. I got a big beef. He let me drop a hundred grand, Sybil. It's your idea, Rudy. Not this way. He let me drop a hundred grand because you ran Fleet Lady. The program said Fleet Lady, and that's who ran. I brought those odds into line at the window. My other lady looked bad on Fleet Lady. You didn't stay to watch her trail the field. All right, I didn't stay. You lost your hundred grand. You killed the ringer. You were a smart big shot who was going to sew up the race. You ran Fleet Lady and cost me a hundred grand. All right, cop, I'll move away from it. Over this way, Sybil. No. Don't let him do it, Patsy. I want to see how tough you are. Come on, Sybil. Let's you and me move against the stall. Watch out, Hauser. You're back in there with the horse. Grab the horse, Novak. He's going to trample him. You grab him. It's your idea. Oh. 
you, Dan. Yeah. You should learn the first time you can't beat the horses. That's a bump joke, Novak. I guess it is. Now that we're all here, who do we book for Jackie Gregg's murder? I'll answer that, friend. Who's this guy? It's one you missed, Hellman. Hello, Stark. Hi, Novak. Well, what are you waiting for, Sybil? Tell the man you killed Jackie Gregg. Had enough trouble today, Ronnie. Oh, you got more coming. Well, you figured it out yet, Novak? Hauser dumped his 80 grand on you. That's right. It's a lot of spending money. Wait a minute. Ronnie, I don't like this. Oh, you get your half, baby. I'm going to write out an I.O.U. When they book you for murder and the vote's in, you can't use it. Wouldn't do a thing like that, Ronnie. A dead girl can't spend 40 grand. She killed your guy, Copper, and tried to palm it off on Novak. I was there, so I'll testify. Ronnie, you're a no good guy. Ah, don't be silly. I love justice. A booker for murder, Copper. I want to tear up that I.O.U. <laughs> Well, Hellman finally worked it out. It started out as a fixed race, and when they were all through, it was up to the horse. Rudy Hauser put the squeeze on Sybil for some dough. She offered to run a fast ringer and place a fleet lady so Hauser could pick up a bag full. Rudy just wanted to make sure, so he sent one of his boys around to knock off fleet lady. Only the guy killed the ringer instead. Well, that was a break for Sybil. She made a deal with a bookie named Ronnie Stark to take all of Hauser's bets and guarantee him that Fleet Lady couldn't win because she wasn't that good a horse. It panned out that way. She let Hauser think Fleet Lady was dead. He spent the twenty grand at the window pushing up the odds on Fleet Lady and dumped another eighty on her to win. The moving van? Now, that was a phony story Greg used to get me to scare Sybil. He wanted in on the deal. He went back to the stable that night, got in a beef, and she killed him. She had him out in her car. When I went to make that phone call, she figured it was a good way to pass the buck. Well, Hellman asked only one question. Why would a nice, tame horse go crazy and trample a guy to death? Jocko had the answer. The horse that killed Hauser was a filly. Broadcasting Company has just brought you the fourth of a new series, Pat Novak, for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced and directed by William P. Rousseau. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. In our cast were Virginia Gregg, Tal Avery, Stacey Harris, Hugh Thomas, and Carlisle Bibbers. This program is being released to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Be with us again next week when over most of these same ABC stations we will bring you Pat Novak for Hire. This program came to you from Hollywood. Listening reminder. Tonight, don't miss Jane Wyman when she guest stars and explains how she created her unforgettable role as the deaf mute in Johnny Belinda. Hear Jane Wyman tonight on this ABC station. This is ABC, the national broadcasting company. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to a robbery detail. A doctor is severely beaten, robbed, and left in critical condition. 
Suspicion points to a narcotics addict. Your job? Get him. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. You'll find they now cost the same. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. You see, Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette because it contains the finest domestic and Turkish tobaccos superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. So compare Fatima yourself. Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first pop will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. <laughs> The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, August 7th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 1.15 p.m. when I got to 4656 Collis Avenue. The front door. Is that you, Joseph? Yeah, Ma, it's me. I didn't expect you so soon. Well, I'm off for lunch, and Ben and I were in the neighborhood, so... Oh, well, I'll get the telegram. Thank you. Say, I'm glad you can get home. Telegrams always make me nervous. Nobody ever sends a telegram unless it's important here, sir. So. Thank you. Yes, they do, Ma. Some people send wires to invite you to lunch or to a reception or something like that. Is that so? Sure. you just forgotten, haven't you? I've gotten them before like that. There's no way to do, anyhow. Why not? People always associate frightening things with telegrams. Well, aren't you going to open it? Oh, yeah, sure. Now, if you were worried, you could open it, Ma. It'd been all right. Well, you know I never open anything addressed to you, Joseph. Anything important? Uh, it's from Belmont, my old high school. Oh, yeah. They want me to come up next week. They're having some sort of assembly up there. Want me to talk to the student body. Well, that's nice. You going to go? Yeah, I think I better, don't you? I'll have to clear it through Captain Sheldon, though. No, I think it's awfully nice for them to remember you. What are you going to talk on, say? Yeah, police work, it says here. Yeah. I'll have to think of something to base it on, though, won't I? Well, you'll have to memorize it, Joseph. Doesn't look well for a man to stand up on a platform and read a prepared talk. Yeah, I know. Oh, well, that's Ben. i got to go, Ma. Would you and Ben like some lunch? I can fix you something in about a minute. No, we haven't got time, dear. I'll see you later. I don't know why they couldn't have written a letter instead. What's that, Ma? I said they could have written you a letter. Besides, it's much cheaper than a telegram. Yeah, Ma. I'll see you later. Bye, Joseph. Bye. Just got a call, Joe. They want us to call the office. Oh, well, I might as well do it from the house, huh? Yeah. All right, I'll be right back. Right. It's just me again, Ma. Came back to use the phone. Yeah. Two five one one, please. Two five one one. This is Friday, Glenn. Got one for you, Joe. What? I can't hear you, Glenn. Got one for you. Wait a minute, I can't hear you. Hey, Ma, would you hold that vacuum for a minute, please? I can't hear. Oh, all right, sir. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry, Glenn. What'd you say again? That's right. That young kid hit again, doctor's office. Yeah. It's that same kid, only this time he got a little rough. Victims of Georgia Street. He's still carrying that gun. Did he use the gun? All right, we'll get right on it. Right, bye. Yeah, bye. Okay, Mom, I'm all through. All right, son. Hello? 
Anything? Yeah. That young hype hit again. Doctor's office beat him up pretty bad. He's down at Georgia. Great combination, isn't it, Joe? What's that? Arm full of narcotics and a loaded gun. Monday, August 7th. Since June 27th, Ben and I had been assigned to a case involving a young narcotics thief. For seven weeks now, he'd been robbing every possible source available to him of narcotics. Since the inception of the investigation, we'd seen this young criminal develop from a small-time sneak thief to a full-fledged, armed, and vicious thug. The descriptions of the young thief taken from his various victims tallied almost to the letter. Blonde, light complexion, small stature, 5'7 to 5'10, nervous and unusually juvenile in appearance. Everything possible was being done for his quick apprehension. Hundreds of mug shots were screened and shown to victims. No identification. 3.30 p.m., we checked back in at the office. Went to see Sergeant Ed Hall, Narcotics Division. Chandler said you went over to Georgia Street to see that doctor. Yeah, that's right, Ed. Short visit. Poor guy. Pretty bad, huh? Well, the guy's really a mess. Kid must have worked overtime on him. And what's his condition? Still critical when we left. They wouldn't let us stay long. We got a description. It's the same kid. Doctor's name was Gannon, huh? Fifty-five years old. Yeah. Pistol whipped him. Knocked out seven of his teeth, fractured his jaw. Doctor was wearing glasses. They don't know if he'll see out of his right eye anymore. Well, this puts Junior in the big leaves now. Yeah, it sure does. We got out a supplementary all points on him. Uh, here's a list of the junk that he got. It's quite a haul here. Yeah. Mm. Morphine, quarter grain, 30 vials. Five vials, half grain coating. Dolphin, quarter grain, six vials. Mm. Yeah, he did all right. Long list here. We got that from the nurse. She was out to lunch when it happened. It's a small office out there, and the doctor closes up at noon. Nurse goes out to lunch, and he eats in the office. That's when the kid got to him. He knew when to hit, didn't he? Yeah. Our boys haven't been able to turn up a thing for you. Nobody seems to know the kid. Well, the amount of stuff he hauled out of that doctor's office, something ought to show, shouldn't it? Should, yeah, all like that. You got anything at all to work on? Yeah, that car that was used on the job. Still got it staked out. We'll we'll just pick this up from the report, Connie. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Car was uh, reported stolen two hours after the robbery. It's a little bit of a break, huh? The report was taken out at the Wilshire station. Mrs. Irving Adams states that her husband had notified her that the car was stolen from him while he was at work today. Said he always parks it out in front on the street. We haven't checked it out yet, but we figured it was a good place to start, maybe. Wait a minute. What'd you say that name was? Irving Adams. Let me see that report. Well, this Adams is a user. He's up in county now, waiting trial. Are you sure about that? Yeah, Walker and I picked him up. I just talked to Adams up in the county jail this morning. How long has he been in? Let's see. uh, It was last Tuesday, July 30th. The car couldn't have been stolen from Adams today if he's been in jail for a week. Well, there's one guy can figure it out for you. Adams. 4.05 p.m. We went up to the 10th floor of the county jail, the interview room. We talked to Irving Adams for an hour. He said he wanted to cooperate, but he couldn't explain his wife's action in reporting the car stolen from him. He kept repeating that he knew his wife was not involved in anything, that she was innocent of any complicity in the case of the youthful gunman. He could give us no information on anyone fitting the gunman's description. He insisted that the entire matter was a mistake and that his wife could clear everything up if we'd just talk to her. 5.20 p.m., Ben and I drove out to 239 West 92nd Street, the Adams residence. It was a small white bungalow trimmed in red. The front lawn needed cutting and care. There were four bottles of soured milk on the front porch along with several old newspapers. The front blinds were down, and although it was still early, the front porch light was burning. The other homes in the neighborhood appeared to be neat and well kept. The screen door was ajar and supported by one rusty hinge. 5.21 p.m. Looks like nobody's home. Well, let's give it a try, huh? Give me a minute, I'll cover the back. Right. Yes? Police officer, my name's Friday. You're Mrs. Irving Adams? Yes, that's right. Well, I'd like to talk to you about your stolen car. Have we found it? Yes, we have. Can I come in? Place is in such a mess. Can't we talk here? Well, if you don't mind, I'd rather come inside. All right. Don't look at the house. I've been kind of sick. Haven't felt much like cleaning up. All right. You 
alone here, are you? Right now, my husband's at work. Mm-hmm. Mind if I go through the house? You mean search it? You got a warrant? Well, I just want to go to the back door. What for? Well, my partner's around back there. This is the way to the back door here? That's right. Mm-hmm. This is it? It's locked. Key's in the door. All uh-huh. right. Hey, Ben. Yeah, everything all right? Yeah, fine. Is he a police officer, too? Yeah, that's right. Is this all there is to the house here? What do you mean? Well, just these three rooms here. Mm, yes, that's all. Well, I thought you said you were alone here. I am. Well, who's that woman lying down in the other room? That's Catherine. Mm-hmm. I didn't want you bothering her. She's been sick, too. She sleeps most of the time. I just forgot about her. Mm-hmm. Anybody else around? No, nobody. No, I mean anybody sick or otherwise. Anyone besides you and this girl in there? Well, you've been in every room in the house except the bathroom. Mm-hmm. This it here? Yes. Okay. I don't understand all this. I reported my car stolen and you come out here and search my house. If I did steal my car, I wouldn't hide it in here. Yeah. Ben, you want to come in? Yeah. Could you tell me something? Yeah. Why are you here? Well, I told you we found your car. This is Sergeant Romero. How do you do? What's the trouble? Anything wrong? Who'd you say your car was stolen from? From me. It was my car. Is that the way you made the report, Mrs. Adams? It was stolen from you? I think so, yes. Ms. Adams, according to the report that you made out this morning, you stated that the car was stolen from your husband, isn't that right? Is that what I said? Yes, ma'am, that's right. Mm, I don't remember we both used the car so much. I forgot. Well, now, which is it, you or your husband? I'm not sure. You've been drinking, have you? A little bit, just to ease my nerves. I haven't been feeling well. Well, it's obvious you're not drunk, Mrs. Adams. Why don't you keep your story straight? Well, officers, I am telling the truth. Well, your husband's in the county jail. He's been there for a week. The car couldn't have been stolen from him, now could it? I didn't say it was stolen from him. Is um, this your signature, Mrs. Adams? Yes, sir. This is a copy of the auto theft report that you made at the Wilshire Division. Yes. Well, now, is this report a true one or a false one? There's a penalty for making a false report, Ms. Adams. I'm sure you're aware of that. I only want my car back. Who was it stolen from? Well, whatever it says there, my husband. Mm-hmm. Now, we just told you that he's in jail. He's still in there. We just talked to him. The car couldn't have been stolen from him. Have you got anything to say to that? No. Well, I think we'd better go downtown where you can sit and straighten yourself out and give us some right answers. I don't want to go to jail. Well, that's just where you're going if you don't snap out of it and come up with the truth. I know who you want. It's Rex Burley, isn't it? Who's Rex Burley? A young kid, blonde, small. He told me he was in some kind of trouble with the car. Said if I tell the police it was stolen, it'd be all right that, that way. Mm-hmm. Do you know where he is now? No, I don't. You sure about that? That's the truth. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Catherine's awful sick. Mm-hmm. She always sleep this heavy? Only when she's sick. Well, she's really out, isn't she? Yeah. Look at her leg. Yeah. She's a user. Say, uh, this girl's on narcotics, Mrs. Adams. Are you a user? No, I'm not. I don't know where Catherine gets it. How about Rex Burley? He's on it, too. Maybe she gets it from him. Is there any stuff in the house now? Not that I know of. You want to tell us where Rex Burley is? I don't know. He called here about an hour ago. Catherine talked to him. Mm-hmm. Did he tell her where he was? Yes, he did. She wrote it down on a piece of paper. Where's that paper? Under a pillow. You are listening to Dragnet. From beginning to end, Dragnet is the authentic story of your police force in action. Now, from beginning to end... The Fatima story. Actual convincing proof that in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos. The finest domestic and Turkish varieties. Extra mild and superbly blended to give you a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Quality of manufacture. 
Smooth, round, perfect cigarettes. Rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Manufactured in the newest and most modern of all cigarette factories. Quality, even to the appearance of the bright, clean, golden yellow package. Carefully wrapped and sealed to bring you Fatima's rich, fresh, extra mild flavor. Because of its quality, its extra mildness, its better flavor and aroma, more long cigarette smokers are now insisting on Fatima than ever before. So if you smoke a long cigarette, compare Fatima. You'll find they now cost the same. But your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Insist on Fatima. Start enjoying the quality king-size cigarette. Fatima. Best of all long cigarettes. Monday, August 7th, 6.30 p.m. The young girl who was identified as Catherine Dorrance was awakened and she produced Rex Burley's address. She stated that she'd known him for the past year. She had just graduated from high school and gave her age as 18. In talking further with both Iris Adams and Catherine Dorrance, we found that the description of Rex Burley checked out with that given us from the suspect's victims. They both stated that, as far as they knew, it was his true name, that he had no friends or associates known to them. A check with R&I showed no record on the name Rex Burley. At 6.37 p.m., Sergeants Hall and Walker from Narcotics Division arrived and continued the investigation of the two female suspects. A stakeout was placed on the house at 239 West 92nd Street. The address we got from Catherine Dorrance was a hotel on Washington Boulevard. We drove out and checked with the clerk. We asked if he had anyone registered under the name of Rex Burley, and he told us no. We gave him Burley's description, and he said that a young man similar to that had registered and was in room 210. We got a pass key from the clerk. We walked up to the second floor. This is it. Mm. Lights on under the door. Yeah. Careful, huh? Yeah. Who is it? Open up. We want to talk to you. What about? It's the key in the door. Yeah, fast key's no good. All right, come on. Open up. Police officers. He's not going to open. All right. Let's hit it. Once more. Yep. Oh, window's open. Up the fire escape, Joe. Police officers, hold it up. Watch it. You all right? Yeah. All right, come on, let's go. All right, hold it up there. He doesn't want to stop. He's over the side, under the roof. All right, come on. All right, easy. See him? No, it's pretty dark. All right, come on. Easy now. All right, easy. Over there on that side, can you see him? No, it's too dark. Watch that skyline. He's over there in that corner. See him? Yeah, now he's gone. Must have ducked back down. Well, he's in that corner. All right, let's take him. Now keep down. You circle around from that side, I'll go around this way. Right. Be careful, keep down. Those hands up. All right, stand still. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right, get your hands behind you. Ben. Let's go, Bernie. I didn't mean to do it. I was wrong. I, I know I was wrong. You should have thought about that a long time ago. How old are you, Burley? Twenty. You're living pretty high, aren't you? I had to have this stuff. I, I needed it. How else could I get it? I, I didn't have the money to buy it. You didn't have to get started on it. Come on, let's go. I didn't want to get started. All of a sudden, I was just on it. I, I couldn't do anything about it. I, you don't understand. There was just somebody else to explain it to. There is, but they won't understand it either. Ah! 
Monday, August 7th, 8.40 p.m. Lex Burley was taken downtown to the robbery division for further interrogation. He told us that he was in his senior year in high school when he got started on narcotics. He kept repeating that he didn't mean to get started. He readily admitted his participation in six narcotics robberies. He told us that he got Catherine Dorrance, his 18-year-old girlfriend, started on dope. Gene Bechtel took his statement and a complete report was made. A partial recovery of the stolen narcotics was made from his hotel room. The remainder had been found at Irving Adams' residence on 92nd Street. Both female suspects, Iris Adams and Catherine Dorrance, were filed on for violation of the State Narcotics Act. A show-up was scheduled for August 8th to allow a positive identification from Rex Burley's victims. We received word from Georgia Street that Dr. Gannon's condition was improved. The suspect was transported to the main jail where he was booked. It was 10.38 p.m. when I got to 1456 Collis Avenue, the front door. Yeah, Ma. Oh, have you had your dinner? No, I'm not hungry. We'll have to eat. I'll fix you something. Oh, I'm kind of tired. I just like to sit down for a minute. All right. Well, there's the evening paper. Oh, thank you. Well, what did you do to the sleeve of your coat? Oh, where? Yeah. Oh, I guess I must have ripped it, huh? Mm-hmm. You can slip it off. I'll mend it after I fix you some dinner. Well, why don't you sit down and work on it now if you want to? I've got something I'd kind of like to go over with you. All right. You remember that telegram from Belmont this morning? Yeah, your old high school. Mm-hmm. Well, I think I got an idea for a speech, maybe. Got the... Just made a few notes here. Mm-hmm. Wrote down some of it. You think you feel like listening to it? See if it's okay? All right. Did you write the speech today? Well, just parts of it. I hadn't written clear out yet. I just got a few notes. I want to see what you thought of it. All right. Well, let me have your coat, son. Yeah. <clears throat> There you go. Hmm. Thank you. Now, let's hear you talk. Well, I remember it's not written down yet. It's just kind of hit and miss as I go along. Mm-hmm. But I think I can get the thought across, and then I'll put it all down on paper. All right. Um, Mr. Fisher, that's the principal up there. You know. Yes. Uh, Mr. Fisher, members of the faculty and students. I'd like to tell you about a young boy who started out in high school and ended up on the roof of a downtown hotel dodging police bullets. I'd like to tell you about his girlfriend, 18 years old and a dope addict. This young fellow started out on narcotics in search of a new thrill, something new that he hadn't experienced in his young life. He was still in high school when a group of the more high-living youngsters used to congregate at the local malt shop. Well, that's not so good, is it? Well, maybe it sounds better this way. There was a malt shop on the corner where some of the youngsters used to get together after school. Kind of a place where if you had the right connections, and our young boy and girl did, you could get a drink of liquor in the back room. Well, the high school faculty knows all about this local malt shop, and they inform the authorities, and pressure is brought to bear. But the man who operates the place is clever. If you can call the operations of a man like this clever... He knows how to cover up, how to keep the front room legitimate and the back room a spawning place for juvenile delinquency. And the students don't help much. There seems to be something during the formation of a juvenile mind that when his teachers or his parents catch him doing wrong or they try to tell him it's bad, he prides himself in seeing how long he can get away with it under covers. Seems to be the stylish thing to do to outwit your parents and teachers. Uh... As the youngsters grow older, they invariably find out how infantile and stupid this is, but sometimes it's too late. Does that sound kind of stuffy, Ma? What do you think? Sounds like the truth. Let me hear the rest of it. Well, you know how kids are. Sometimes they resent it if they think you're lecturing them. Maybe no. They could have been with Ben and I tonight. It might make a difference. Well, I don't want to make this too long, Ma. I think maybe I ought to finish up something like this. From this malt shop on the corner in that back room... Our young boy gets a good shove down the road of self-degradation. He has the right connections, and 
isn't too long before he graduates the liquor in the back room for something he thinks it's far better, narcotics. He's heard that unlike liquor, you can't smell it on his breath. And he's a real veteran now. He has hangovers. He's heard that narcotics doesn't leave you with a hangover. So it doesn't take too long before, in our, well, in police parlance, he's hooked. Living in this day and age, he thought that they taught him well in his economics and civics classes. He thought he knew what post-war inflation was all about. He didn't have the vaguest notion of the cost of his daily supply of narcotics once he was hooked on it. He found that before long, he had to have his daily dosage. In no time at all, he found that it was all he could do to get by on $30 a day. That's what it cost, Mark. $30 each and every day, or he became violently ill, so sick that he couldn't seem to function properly. Well, in order to maintain his daily needs, he got a gun, and he robbed, and he beat people, and he stole. He shared with his girlfriend, and he dragged her down with him. He ended up on the roof of a hotel trying to shoot his way out. Well, the boy was 20 years old. His girlfriend was 18. Two years ago, they both sat out there in a high school auditorium during an assembly. He went a long way, didn't he, in his two years out of high school? He was taken into custody on the night of August 7th. He was crying when we put the handcuffs on him. He was crying when we left him in his cell at the county jail. I guess he's still crying. What do you think, Mom? That's just rough, I haven't... Mm -hmm. I'm going to let him believe it. You think it'll do any good? Well, I don't know, Ma. It's up to them. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 9th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 83, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Friends, there are many cases on record of two people not related, looking so much alike it's hard to tell them apart. A quick check of fingerprints, however, easily proves who's who. Now, at first sight, you could just as easily be fooled by king-size cigarettes. If you were to place a Fatima and any other king-size cigarette side by side, you'd find they look identical. But believe me, there's a real difference. In Fatima, that difference is quality. Quality that gives you extra mildness, a much better flavor and aroma. Compare Fatima with any king-size cigarette. The size is the same, now the price is the same. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. Buy a pack tomorrow. <laughs> Rex Martin Burley was found guilty of three counts of robbery in the first degree and was sentenced to the state penitentiary where he is now serving his term. First degree robbery is punishable by imprisonment from five years to life. The Federal Civil Defense Administration will send you an air raid instruction sheet if you will write the Superintendent of Documents, Washington, D.C., enclosing five cents in coin or stamps. <laughs> You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portions transcribed from Los Angeles. Stay tuned for Counter Spy, next over many NBC stations. Dr. Kildare. Whatsoever house I enter, there will I go for the benefit of the sick. And whatsoever things I see or hear concerning the life of men, I will keep silence thereon, counting such things to be held as sacred trust. I will exercise my art solely for the cure of my... The story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers and Lionel Dufresne. Dr. Kildare. Metro Goldwyn Mayer brought you those famous motion pictures. Now this exciting, heartwarming series is heard on radio. In just a moment, the story of Dr. Kildare. But first, your announcer.
of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers as Dr. Kildare and Lionel Barrymore as Dr. Gillespie. Parker said you wanted to see me, Dr. Gillespie. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were alone. It's all right, Jim. Come in. Come in. Uh, Mr. Sarvo, this is Dr. Kildare. Dr. Kildare? How do you do, sir? Jimmy? Mr. Sarvo has presented me with a problem, and I wanted you here as a witness. Oh? Mr. Sarvo wants me to examine a man and treat him, but he wants me to do it without knowing the identity of the patient. Nobody can know his identity. That is imperative. (laughs) It's also highly unusual, Mr. Sarvo. I assure you it is necessary. It's also necessary that I protect Blair Hospital. I don't understand. Oh, that should be rather simple to understand, Mr. Sarvo. For all Dr. Gillespie knows, you may be asking him to treat a a criminal or something. A man wanted by the law. No, I give you my word. The man you will treat is not a criminal. Quite the contrary. Well, then why can't you tell me who he is? Dr. Gillespie, I can't even give you a reason. All I can say is that I hope someday I may be able to explain it to you. Uh, Oh, there's one thing we're entitled to know. You uh, didn't choose Blair Hospital and Dr. Gillespie out of thin air for this case. The choice was made after extensive inquiry. Dr. Gillespie is reputed to be the finest internist available. Hmm. How do you know your patient needs an internist? Because of the symptoms. Severe abdominal pain, general malaise, insomnia. Dr. It is my understanding that you cannot refuse to treat a patient simply because you do not know his identity. Oh, just a moment, Mr. Sarvo. Dr. Gillespie hasn't refused treatment. Then there's nothing further to discuss, is there? I will reserve two rooms here at the hospital for tomorrow morning. I'll occupy one of them so that I may be close at hand. And your patient will be admitted to the other under the name of John Smith. John Smith. <laughs> All right. Bring him in the morning and we'll have a look at him. Thank you, gentlemen. I wish I could tell you what a tremendous trust is being placed in your hands. Oh, just a moment, Mr. Sarvo. Uh, Dr. Gillespie, uh, according to the symptoms, we probably should run a GI series. Hmm? The patient might as well be prepared for it anyway when he comes in. Huh? Yes, 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 of course, Jimmy, that's right. Uh, see that your uh, John Smith takes no food or liquid of any kind after midnight tonight. Have him here and ready for examination at 8 o'clock in the morning. Any request you make will be granted, Doctor. Yeah. Any request will be granted, Doctor, except telling us who the patient really is. Someday, frustration of your curiosity will give you an ulcer. Oh, is that so? <laughs> when did I ever go around sticking my nose into other people's business? I... What was that noise? That I know. Uh, since when have you taken over the janitor's job? You were listening at the keyhole. That's what you were doing. Oh, I was not. No, you were so. You're just busting to find out who John Smith is. Why, I... Ah, oh, go on. Go back to your work and stop meddling. Well, you don't have to go hollering just because I'm interested in my job, you know. <laughs> Women. Did you ever see anybody so nosy in all your life, Jimmy? Uh, that's a delicate question. Well, if a man wants to call himself John Smith, it's nobody's business but his own. Oh, I quite agree. Yeah. Who the devil can he be picking such a silly name like that? Oh, it may find out in the morning while we're finding out what's wrong with him. Now, don't be nervous, Mr. Smith. Horoscope can't harm you. Boy, it just makes it possible for us to see how you're functioning organically. I quite understand. I, uh, <laughs> I won't be a difficult patient. Oh, I'm sure you won't. Uh, heart looks all right. Uh, move the viewing plate down, Jimmy. Okay. Get a look at the, uh... Hmm. Look at this, Dr. Gillespie. I see it, yeah. In the pyloric region. Uh, have you had difficulty retaining food lately, Mr. Smith? Yes. Sometimes I suffer from uh, e- extreme nausea. Uh, better get a better look at that, Jimmy. Parker, uh, where's the barium mixture? Uh, right here, Dr. Gillespie. Give it to Dr. Kildare. Thank you. Oh, uh, Mr. Smith, I want you to take this glass in your left hand. Got it? Yes. Now, this is barium. 
It's a metallic liquid. Harmless, but it shows up well in the fluoroscope and x-ray. We can trace its course through your digestive tract. I want you to start by taking just one large swallow. All right, doctor. That's good, good. Now, just hold the glass. I want you to drink the rest of it in a minute. Uh, use a little hand pressure, Jimmy. All right. Force it around the pyloric region. Let me know if this causes you any discomfort, Mr. Smith. Mm. See it clearly now? Yeah, very clearly. All right, Mr. Smith, drink the rest of the mixture. Pay it all down quickly as possible, please. Now, I'll tilt the backboard into table position. I want you to climb up on it and lie down on your stomach. That's it. Now, lie on your right side of your face. Arms above your head, please. I'll move the view plate, Jimmy. Thanks. Hey, there it is. That's the spot. Yes. Hmm. All right, Parker, turn off the fluoroscope, put on the lights. You just stay in that same position for a few minutes, Mr. Smith. All right. Want me to call the X-ray technician? Yeah, yeah. Tell them to take four quarter views and, and let's know when they're ready. After the X-rays are finished, you can go back to your room, Mr. Smith. We'll talk to you later. Thank you, Doctor. Well, what do you think, Jimmy? We'll know better when we see the X-rays, of course, but there's a definite growth on the pylorus. A dangerous growth. Not necessarily, not unless it's malignant. Well, if it isn't now, it will be if it's left there much longer. I'd recommend exploratory surgery unless the plates indicate a benevolent tumor. I am afraid that what we saw wasn't benevolent. Here are the x-rays, Dr. Gillespie. Huh? Oh, good. Let's have a look at them. I'm afraid they don't require very much looking. Yeah. You agree? All the appearances of carcinoma. That's what I thought. A little have to be removed. Uh, and in a couple of weeks at the most. If the growth spreads, the pylorus will be completely obstructed. After that, we'd be too late. Well, we don't have any worry on that score. Mm. It isn't too late now, from all indications. It's still operable, and I'd say the prognosis is favorable. Oh, definitely. Uh, unless complications develop. Mm. None manifest. Well, serious complications seldom are. They pop up when they're least expected. That's what makes them serious. Guess we'd better have a talk with Smith and get his consent for surgery. Uh, Mr. Sabo has asked that we discuss our findings with him first, Jimmy. He's been in my outer office for an hour. You know, that's an odd relationship between Sarvo and Smith. Did. What do you suppose is behind it? Well, well, Dr. Kildare, who's busting with curiosity now? Oh, come now, Dr. G. Your long nose is still showing. It is not. Parker! Parker! Yes, Dr. Gillespie? Is Mr. Sarvo still there? Yes, Mr. Yes. Uh, send him in, please. Doctor, we'll see you now, Mr. Sargo. Thank you. Oh, gentlemen, he's all right, isn't he? There, there's nothing seriously wrong. Are you asking us or telling us? Well, I'm sorry, Doctor. I'm upset. Now, please, please tell me what you found. Your friend's a very sick man, Mr. Sargo. I'll be blunt with you. We've located what seems to be a cancerous growth. Then he's going to die. Nobody said that. Well, fortunately, you brought him here in time. The growth is operable. No, Doctor. You're wrong. Hmm? The growth is not operable. Not with him. Are you a doctor, Mr. Sarvo? No, but I know something that you have yet to learn. Then you'll understand. I'll begin by telling you who John Smith really is. Well? The man you know as John Smith is Philip III, King of Corsonia. Oh, that's oh, impossible. Philip of Corsonia abdicated his throne, made the country a democracy 15 years ago. He's been living in England. He has been here incognito for several months. Why couldn't you tell us this before? Because he has enemies. In four months, there will be a plebiscite in Corsonia, an election that will determine whether the country remains democratic or falls before a rising dictatorship. Philip is the one man who can rally the democratic forces, bring the split factions together. Well, then the operation is even more imperative. If we don't operate, he'll be dead in two months. I know, Doctor. But there's nothing you can do to save him. But we told you that the whole... Just a minute, Jimmy, just a minute. I'm afraid we're dealing with more than cancer. We're dealing with the curse of royal blood. 
Uh, is Philip a descendant of the Bourbon Savo? Yes. Yeah. You mean he's a hemophiliac, a bleeder? Yes, Doctor. <sighs> what can we do, Dr. Gillespie? If we don't operate on him, he'll die of cancer in two months. If we do operate, his blood won't coagulate. He'll bleed to death on the table. Jimmy, that man is doomed. <laughs> return to the story of Dr. Kildare in just a moment. You understand? I understand that you have tried to deprive Blair Hospital of the greatest publicity story in its history. Publicity. If one word of this leaks out, I'll cut out your giblets. But really, you expect me to ignore... How did you find out? I have my sources of information. Oh, oh, wow. So that's it. Parker... Did you call me your magic? Uh, oh, I mean, uh, the Dr. Gorsuch. You nitwit. So that's why you've been practicing that funny bowing stuff. Well, for your information, it's not funny bowing stuff. It's but what they do at court, and it's called a curtsy. Curtsy. A curtsy. With those pretzel legs of yours. Pretzel legs. Let me tell you. You I tell have... me nothing, nothing. I'll tell you, both of you. A man is going to die in the country he loves may die with him. Is that what you two blabbermouths want to turn into a publicity circus? Get out of here! Ah, uh, Dr. Kildare, come in. Uh, how are you today, Mr... Uh... No. <laughs> I gave up being a king 15 years ago. Call me Philip, please. And, and regard me as a friend. Oh, thank you. Savo tells me that I have two months, Doctor. Oh, of course, we can never be certain about no, those. No, no. It's all right. I, I had hoped it might be longer. I, not for myself, but, but for my people. If only I could live until the plebiscite. To see them secure with an honorable government, I... I would do anything. Would you gamble on losing the two months you do have to live? Uh, would you take that chance? Why do you ask, Dr. Kildare? Because even with the odds of thousand to one against us, I'm going to ask you to risk that operation. But with hemophilia... It... Just a moment, Savo. Go ahead, Dr. Kildare. Well, when a hemophiliac lives to maturity, as you have, there's sometimes an improvement in the condition of his blood. Not much, but some. With a strict pre-surgical regime, we might make some slight additional improvement. Maybe enough to give us just the ghost of a chance. How can you ask him to take this risk? You're forgetting something, Savo. I am going to die in any case. Dr. Kildare is asking me to risk what time I have left against... The faint hope of recovery, and with it, life for our people. I'm sorry, Philip. I withdraw my objection. 
All right, Doctor. I'll gamble with you. But do you realize you are gambling, too? I realize that very keenly. Well, then why are you doing this, Doctor? I have my reasons. Very well. When will you uh, operate? In about two weeks. When we've prepared you as best we can. I'll start by having the nurse bring you a capsule. It's uh, an ovarian extract. You ought to have one every three hours around the clock from now until surgery. The other preparations, well, you'll be acquainted with them as we go along. Send for me, Dr. Gillespie? You know, Don, well, I did. Sit down, Jimmy. Sit down. What are you up to? Why, well, I don't know what you mean. Do you think I'm deaf, dumb, and blind? What's behind those uh, extracts you've been prescribing for Philip? Well, Dr. Gillespie, I, I've started him on a pre surgery regime. A pre surgery? Jimmy killed there. Have you gone mad? You've got to try it. Have you thought of what failure means? The life of one man who will die anyhow. Oh, I know that. But the world won't know about it. Or about the odds against you. They'll only know that a king died under your scalpel. And your future as a doctor will die with him. I can't let that matter. Not in the face of what it means to his country. Or what it may mean to the rest of the world. What does it mean to us? If Philip lives, it guarantees a democracy in Corsonia. A friendly nation in the strategic heart of Europe. Something to help balance our world against everything that might try to destroy it. And does my reputation mean more than that? Uh, well, you're right, Jimmy. We've no choice. Let's have it. What are you planning? Oh, well, now, Dr. Gillespie, I can't ask you to share this. Oh, confound it, Jimmy Kildare. Don't you try pulling that on me. I brought you into this case, and we'll see it through together. <laughs> Now, if we can get a look at this blood smear under the microscope. It, it did a, a lot of bleeding for a simple finger punches. I know, I know. How does that slide look? The platelet counts all right. Let's see, about 250,000, but hmm. there's still a qualitative defect. That's the trouble. It won't clot. Hey, baby. We'll call a donor. <laughs> All set for direct transfusion, Dr. Kildare. Thanks, Parker. Now, uh, you may bleed quite a bit, sir. I understand. Clench and unclench your fist after I enter the vein. Now, here we go. Hey, what's the point of entry, Jimmy? It's all right. He'll get more than he loses. Yeah, not as much as you'll need. <laughs> Platelets look a little better, Dr. G. Uh, clotting time didn't. It still took too long. Well, we'll have to give him another direct transfusion in surgery. Parker, prepare an injection of fresh serum. 30 cc's. Intramuscular. Yes, Parker, but I'll administer it. I better repeat the same injection 24 hours before surgery. I will. But that'll be it, Dr. Gillespie. There's nothing else we can do. Yes, there is, Jimmy. Yes, there is. Give it up. I can't. I've given my word, win or lose. Parker, see that the operating room is ready Wednesday morning at 7 o'clock. Scalpel, Parker. Yes, Doctor. How are those hemoclamps, Dr. Gillespie? All right. Jimmy, but hurry, hurry, hurry. No time for pathology. We've got to get out fast. Open the transfusion valve a little more, Parker. He isn't getting it fast enough. Hmm. Carcinoma isn't too bad. I'll be finished in a minute. Oh, the cancer isn't our worry. Dr. Kildare. What is it, Dr. Mason? I'm not getting a pulse, Doctor. I can't stop. Quickly, Parker. Coramine hypo. Here. I'll take it. Right into the heart muscle, Dr. Gillespie. Huh? There it is, Jimmy. And I've got all of the growth ready for suturing. Any response, Dr. Mason? No, I do Wait a minute. Yes. Faint, but there's a pulse. Step up the oxygen, please. 
Watch those emo clamps, Jimmy. I am, but we've got to close him up fast. Can't take much more blood from the donor. Pulse is holding easily, Doctor, but still faint. We'll make it. We'll get him out alive, and we've got to keep him that way. <laughs> That's a tough one, Jimmy. Yeah. Get those ice packs ready, Parker. Temperature change around the incision may help clotting. How about cannon applications? Try it, try it. We'll try anything now. We've got nothing to lose. Hello, Jimmy. Oh, Dr. G. How is he? Oh, I... I'm afraid. I'm afraid we've lost. See for yourself. But, Jimmy, there's no excessive blood loss here. Clotting seems to be all right. All right, but too late. Jimmy, come over here. Is he gone? Gone, nothing. Well, what was his last temperature reading? Very low, almost down to 96. Well, it's better than that now. You can tell by a feeling. Get those ice packs off right away. He does seem to be warmer. Ah, of course, he's warmer. He's not in coma. He's in shock from loss of blood. But he's holding now. Uh, let his temperature come up. The clotting is strong enough to hold. If he's watched every minute to keep him from moving. Once he comes out of shock, one more transfusion would get him over the hump. Yes, unless... Unless we failed where we can't see our failure. Inside, there may be internal loss. But know. there is. He won't regain consciousness. There is. It'll be my fault. Don't ever say that, Jimmy. Getting him this far is a miracle... You had to work faster than any surgeon I've ever seen. I and mean, against fantastic odds. He's stirring. He's coming around. Talk to him. Penetrate his consciousness. I'll try. Philip. Uh, Philip. Uh, Philip, do you hear me, Philip? The Dr. Gilbert. He's coming through, Jimmy. Yes. Yeah. Finished? Yes, Philip, we're finished. It's all over. You'll be all right now. Ah. Uh. Faith in you. You couldn't have had faith in a better man. Jimmy, I'm going to call the donor. Oh, I'll do it, Dr. Gilbert. No, 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 no. You stay here with your patient. I'm the assistant on this case, and I'm proud of it. In just a moment, we will return to the story of Dr. Kildare. You see in the morning papers? Hey, look. Results of the Corsonia plebiscite. Look at that headline. Uh, former monarch leads Democratic faction to overwhelming victory. Mm -hmm. People rally to execute. Jimmy, that is wonderful. I know, and look at this. The man we knew as Sarvo was elected president of the Republic. Ah, president. I like that word, Jimmy. I like it. Gives me a safe Dr. Kildare, oh, Dr. Kildare. Yes, Parker, Parker, must you come in here like you were shot out of a cannon? Well, I wanted to give this to Dr. Kildare. It's a cablegram. It just came all the way from Europe. From Europe? Here. What is it? What does it say? Oh, well, I'll give him a chance to open it. Do you think he has x-ray eyes? Good. Well, Jimmy, what does it say? Hmm. It's from Philip. It says... President Sarvo and I thank you for a victory that would not have been possible without your help and the help of Dr. Gillespie. <laughs> and persuading Sarvo to appoint me ambassador to the United States and look forward to seeing you again. <laughs> Sarvo and I pledge that you and your country will always have friends in ours. With humble gratitude, Phil. <laughs> You 
have just heard the story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers and Lionel Barrymore. This program was written by Joel Murcott and directed by Joe Bigelow. Original music was composed and conducted by Walter Schumann. Virginia Gregg was heard as Nurse Parker and Ted Osborne as Dr. Carew. Others in the cast included Larry Dobkin and Ben Wright. Dick Joy speaking.